the second session of the Aurora City Council for Monday, uh, March 21st, 2022, uh, is called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Kaufman? Uh, yes. Mayor Pro Tim Bergen? Here. Councilmember Coombs? Present. Councilmember Gardner? Here. Councilmember Drinsky? Here. Councilmember Lawson? Here. Councilmember Marcano? Present. Councilmember Medina? Councilmember Medina? Councilmember Murillo? Present. Councilmember Senberg? Here. Councilmember Zavonic? Here. There's a quorum. Uh, announcement for the call in, Lauren. Good evening. Thank you for joining tonight's Aurora City Council study session. If you are listening on the phone, please note public comments are not taken during study sessions. The phone line is in listen only mode. The City Council welcomes comments at regular council meetings on both matters appearing on the agenda and during public invited to be heard. The phone line opens for sign up on those evenings at 6 p.m. Have a good meeting. Uh, no mayor's update, no issue update. A consent calendar, uh, item number 2A through, through 2E. Is there any objection uh, to moving item number 2A through 2E forward? Let's see, no objection. Uh, the consent calendar will move forward. Uh, item number 3A, IGA with uh, the Officer of uh, Al Alternate Defense Council for the uh, provision of conflict conflict uh, attorney representation. Uh, Sean, uh, Judge uh, Sean Day. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Pro Tem, members of council, good evening. Um, thank you for putting this on the agenda. Uh, this deals with an IGA with the Offices of Alternative Defense Council for the provision of conflict um, representation. Within our code 50-171, um, it reads, for cause, the court may on its own motion or upon the application of the municipal public defender or the indigent person appoint any, excuse me, appoint an attorney other than the municipal public defender to represent the indigent person at any stage of the proceedings. The attorney shall be paid reasonable compensation and reimbursement for expenses necessarily incurred to be fixed by the Public Defender Commission and paid from the budget of the Office of the Municipal Public Defender. Um, we appoint conflict counsel when there is a conflict for the public defender to represent an indigent uh, person in our court. Doug Wilson, who I believe is on the line in addition to Angela Garcia, um, did a lot of work with the Office of Alternative Defense Counsel to set this up as their as our fallback agency to represent people when there is a conflict. Um, you should have, have been provided in your backup the 14-page IGA that sets forth the terms of the agreement. In addition, you should have also been provided with uh, the resolution as it relates to this specific issue. Uh, because I didn't have um, specific dealings with the Office of Alternative Defense Council in setting this up, Doug Wilson did, I'll be happy to turn it over to him to answer uh, or to fill in any blanks or gaps or in answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, I don't know if you have any questions. Basically, the, the conflict budget is in our budget. You give us that money every year. We, the, when, when I became the public defender, we were, we're in a position of actually setting up the conflict list which becomes a little bit uh, uncomfortable when I'm selecting the lawyers that we are then hiring to do the co-defendant cases. Well, that's typically the conflicts that we are hiring counsel for. This gives us the opportunity to uh, allow the alternate defense counsel to select, train, and supervise the conflict Council, as opposed to my office or the court doing it, and it removes this layer of what I think is is really an uncomfortable position that we have been put in when we are 
suggesting that we have a conflict in representing a co-defendant, but we're also selecting a lawyer to represent the co-defendant. So it's it's a cost neutral. It's not costing us any additional money. We are just have worked out this agreement with alternate defense counsel to, as I said, select, train, and supervise those lawyers. Uh, uh, questions? Uh, <laughs> And just one uh, quick one, uh, and that is, uh, can you give me an example of a conflict? Sure. If we have, let's let's say there's a domestic violence situation where um, both parties have been charged, we can't represent um, the, the the two spouses, the two partners, especially when they're pointing the fingers at each other, uh, Mayor Kaufman, they have um, mutual uh, defenses. One is saying that he did it or she did it. Uh, and so any situation where we are in a strict co-defendant situation, we're prohibited from representing both parties. Even though you could have uh, two separate lawyers within your your department doing it? Yes, sir. Still can't do it? Okay. Yes, um, I'm sorry, somebody had a question? Actually, you asked it. Okay. Uh, further questions? I see none. Well, uh, is there any objection? Uh, uh, to moving this forward. I see no objection that item number 3A will move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number 3B, uh, uh, comprehensive crime strategy uh, resolution. Um, let's see, um, council member uh, Dustin Zavonik. Uh, thanks, Mayor. So the, the purpose of this resolution um, is to have a focused and intentional um, strategy as it relates to reducing crime in our city. Um, what we, the old saying goes, what, what gets measured and gets done. And what we recognize is there, there is not a day that goes by that we aren't reminded of the urgency to address crime and public safety in our city. And we know that as a local government, as a city, that there are some things that are just going to be outside of our reach. There are things that our governor and legislature have handicapped our ability to keep our community safe with by passing offender friendly laws over the course of the past couple of years. But that being said, we believe it's important to have a very intentional focus on addressing uh, crime in our city and having a, a set of core strategies that we are asking the city, that this resolution asks the city manager and through the, the requisite um, staff to come once a month um, to the Public Safety Committee and to report back to us on the progress of these various core strategies, many of which, by the way, we are already doing, but we are lumping them together as a part of an overall plan to address crime and to give us both updates on progress being made, but also make additional recommendations for tactics that we might need to add to the various strategies. Um, that we outline in this resolution. So I'm going to go through that there's five core tactics or five key tactics or strategies um, that we outline. The first one is a fully funded um, and fully staffed Aurora Police Department. There's just without a question that until our police department is fully staffed and funded, um, we are going to continue to struggle to keep pace with the crime that we're seeing in our city. We also make in that um, first strategy, we talk about the need to have industry leading training. Um, for our department. This is, I think, core to our ability to actually have a fully staffed department. I think people who come to work for the city in the department are going to want to know that they have the best available training and we should insist upon that. Um, and to going along with that idea of an industry leading department, the next uh, core strategy we discuss is the implementation of a data, data driven um, po uh, data driven policing. We have to use the, the, the best technology, the most, um, uh, whether it's systems and data, to ensure that we're policing in the right ways and most efficient and effective ways to address crime. Um, we have to continually stay on top of that. So making sure that we have the right systems and the right data in place and we're collecting the right data, this is going to be especially important as we um, enter into this phase of working with our consent decree monitor to ensure uh, sufficient compliance, making sure that we're collecting the right data and utilizing it, most importantly, to keep our community safe. The third um, strategy that we talk about is taking the, the um, AGRIP program that Council Member Lawson has worked on refocusing to ensure that we are addressing youth violence. Um, we want to continually see updates on the progress that are made. I know that she outlined in her resolution a plan to 
um, see that program be, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, Council Member Lawson, but 80% intervention, 20% prevention. We want to see regular updates, the Public Safety Committee, and I, I believe in the resolution, we also call for a quarterly update to all of us at large. So that the, the third um, core strategy is the, the implementation of the AGRIP program. And the fourth is expanding of our crisis response times, our CRTs. Um, that is where we have a clinician that goes out with a uh, law enforcement officer. I know tonight we're gonna hear about the mobile response teams. I think that the mobile response teams should continue to be used, but they should only be used in those instances where we know for certain that we are not putting the clinician or the medic in harm's way. Anytime there is at all question of whether or not um, it could be a dangerous situation, it should be our crisis response team where an officer will be involved. Um, and I think that expanding that program, it's currently a grant funded program, expanding it. Um, and if Aurora Mental Health can't continue to meet the needs in terms of number of clinicians, we should go to other partners. But I think that that would be an important part of this overall plan. And then the final um, uh, strategy that we put is the, as we implement the camping ban that we have one more vote on in order to um, put, it, put it into motion, it's gonna be critical that we have consistent enforcement. Um, people have often said, well, Denver has a ban and it doesn't work. And, and a big reason for that is that it's inconsistently at best enforced. Um, if we're gonna address public safety as it relates to the encampments in our city, we have to make sure that that policy is, um, is consistently implemented. So what this resolution is an attempt to do is take um, strategies, frankly, that we're already doing and to focus them together in a comprehensive way to require regular monthly updates to the Public Safety Committee and quarterly to council and say, this is our um, action plan of, of uh, things that we as a city can do to address crime um, and to improve public safety in our city, because this is clearly something that our residents are begging for. We saw a youth all-star game canceled um, in our city, and I know that it wasn't because of the city, but because there was a perception of, of our city not being safe, um, and, I, and it's it's not acceptable. We should, it, it doesn't matter which part of the city you live in, you should feel safe in Aurora. And unless and until that day comes, we have to make sure that public safety is on at the front of all of our minds. And so this resolution, I hope, is a step in that direction. Uh, do you have any other presentation, uh, Council Member Zavani? No, sir. So, uh, discussion? Mayor. Uh, Council Member O'Connell. Thank you, sir. Um, and thank you, Council Member Zavani, for running through the, present or the resolution. Uh, and I agree, this is something that, by and large, we're already doing. So I'm not exactly sure why we're passing a resolution to reinforce the fact that we're already doing this. I feel like saying, well, no, we really mean it is not necessary. I think our staff understands uh, council's will here. Um, I also want to point out that the, I think the second whereas clause that you have in here really reads like an editorial page from a conservative newspaper rather than a policy statement, which is what we're working on here. Um, and so I was wondering, could you cite the laws that are causing those issues that you have in this resolution? Sure, um, so first of all, uh, Mayor, Yes, please. So two things. First, you said, why do the resolution when we're already doing it? One, uh, again, as I said, what gets measured gets done. And so having an intentional focus where these, um, the, we get regular updates as opposed to these are things that are happening in the background. I think we need to have an intentional focus from city staff and brought to our attention the, the progress that, we're being, that are being made in each of these programs. That's why this resolution is um, where it is. And it'll also give us a chance to really ask whether or not we need to add additional tactics to each of these core strategies in order to be effective in each of them. The second one, um, yeah, there's a lot of things. Look, the decriminalization of fentanyl, um, the fact that we haven't addressed homelessness at a statewide level, um, the, the recent, uh, I think it was, I forget the number now, maybe 271 last year where you expanded the types of felonies that would um, still allow the um, felons to carry guns, which just went into effect this March or March 1st of this year. Um, the fact that we have abuses, and I understand that the legislature tried to expand it, but thankfully it was shot down, um, the abuse of PR bonds, but it, we haven't done anything to reform it when we see repeat offenders constantly. So there's plenty of that I could continue to go on about at the st uh, um, state laws that have made our state and our city less safe. Um, our legislature just by the, the, in fact, look, 271, the fact that we've, um, during a period of time, we, we um, took steps to codify into law 
a position of anti-law enforcement. We need to bring qualified immunity back and make um, sure that a, a law enforcement understands that we support them. We can't have people leaving the profession in droves and expect to keep our community safe. So this legislature and our governor have failed our state, they failed our city, and they failed our families in making us less safe. And we can't fix all of their problems, but we can address the things at the city level that we're responsible for, and that's what I hope to do with this resolution. Uh, Council Member Zavonik, I think you're referring to Senate Bill 217. Am I correct? 17, 271 was the other one, correct. Yes, okay. sir. Okay, very good. Now, yeah. uh, further discussion. Mayor. Uh, Council Member McConnell. Thank you, sir. I do have a follow up for you, Council Member Zavonik. Can you explain why the nationwide trend that we're seeing is somehow the fault of those specific laws uh, that don't exist in other states? They're not, uh, Mayor. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, Council Member Zavonik. Go ahead. Uh, the nationwide trend is, there's no question that we've seen an uptick in crime across the country, but we're seeing it worse in Colorado. Colorado has the fourth worst crime rate uh, in the country. This is, you know, Governor Polis said his goal is to be in the top 10 safest, I guess, number one safest uh, state is too ambitious for him, and I get that. We should strive as a city to be better than the state and to be better than the rest of the nation and not just to run with the pack, but or to lead the pack, not just run with the herd. Further discussion. Uh, is there any objection uh, to sorry. moving? I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Coombs. Um, yes. So I just want to clarify a couple of points. Um, mainly that there really wasn't any data behind what was just stated. There it was a repetition of statements of opinion about impacts of laws that we actually don't have um, data-driven, non-editorial uh, articles or presentations. Um, I also think characterizing uh, not acting on homelessness as an offender-friendly policy is misunderstanding um, what homelessness is. Homelessness is not about being an offender, as this council has tried to convey through various actions, but is trying to survive and is something we should be helping people do is try to survive and get out of homelessness, not treat the homeless as offenders. Um, and, you know, I'm very concerned that the kind of intent behind this resolution seems to be to chastise our legislators who not only have tried to make sure everyone is safe, and when we say everyone in our city is safe, that also means people who have been victimized by violence committed by law enforcement. And it's an issue that we as a city have been under great scrutiny for. So I don't think we can just say everyone in our city is safe if we only focus on promoting and supporting law enforcement and we don't promote and support people who have been killed and victimized by law enforcement. That's not making sure everybody in our city is safe. And I agree that we need to make sure everybody in our city is safe. Um, and finally, I think that we need to recognize the efforts of our, our legislators currently. So not only were their past efforts done with specific intentions of addressing and promoting public safety, your point about PR bonds I think is extremely overstated. And in fact, the intent of that was to make sure that there's room in our jails for people who actually have committed and are committing crimes and not keeping people there pre-trial. Um, and they're also currently passing policies to address crime in our cities. I know Council Member Lawson was just recently down there testifying in support of one of the bills um, on public safety that our one of our state senators was a co-sponsor on. So I just overall, I think that we need to make sure that when we're passing policy statements, that they're about policy and they're not about opining about what other levels of government are doing. Um, and that we're focusing in a data-driven way on what we're going to do, which is what you're saying you're doing, but then you're stating a lot of opinions without backing them up with data. Further discussion? Mayor. Uh, Councilor McConnell. Thank you, sir. Uh, and I also just wanted to add to that that we already have reports on a lot of these items through public safety and through housing redevelopment or neighborhood services, so I'm concerned about the redundancy for reporting this will add. Um, I've attended, I think, all but three public safety meetings since I've been in office, even though I've never served on the committee. So my suggestion is if uh, y'all want to know what's going on with homelessness and those other things, attend horns as well. Um, they're really informative committees, and I think we'd make better policy decisions if we were all on the same page on that. And I also, uh, on the data-driven uh, policy point, I could not agree more. 
Um, and I just want to remind you all that we had a presentation from our hazard uh, mitigation or of a hazard mitigation plan that showed a very, very clear map of the city and some of the most at risk parts of the city that we have with regards to um, socioeconomic issues and other things that could make managing a hazard or a major issue in Aurora very difficult. And I just want to highlight again that that also overlaps with the, the heat map that we already have for where a lot of um, you know calls for service through 911 come from. And then if we're serious about this, we need to address those root causes and not just keep responding harder because that's not gonna get folks anywhere. I agree that everyone wants to be safe and should be able to be safe anywhere in Aurora. This is a beautiful city, it has amazing people, great food and a bunch of great culture here. Um, but we are not currently doing anything that is really impactful obviously based off of the trend that we're seeing here. And I would say that this applies nationwide as well. Um, the status quo is not working. The inequality and inequity is growing, and we need to address that if we're serious about, you know, making our community safer, not just grandstand and, you know, give speeches that make you sound like you're running for state office, honestly. So thank you. Mayor. Uh, Mayor. Sorry. Uh, Council, uh, Mayor Pritam. Yes, thank you. Um, I don't know why there's opposition to this because um, Council Member Zavonik is, is basically just asking for us to to focus on solutions for for preventing crime, solving crime, um, and I hear it. I have heard it for two years, nonstop. Whether it's on social media, phone calls to me, emails to me, number one issue that people are sick and tired of is the crime escalation, es escalating. And unfortunately, we don't have all the resources, and we haven't had the resources to address a lot of these things. So I think. You know, we can get into, you know, the whereases or whatever. I think the intent behind this is really good. It is to focus and it is also to make sure that we get updates, um, whether it be at the Public Safety Committee. I like the quarterly reports that go to, goes to all of council. When we get questions from constituents about, well, what are you doing? And that's what I get all the time. What are you doing to address crime? I would like to be able to have some information um, because I know, you know, we've taken steps currently to do things, but it, it would just be nice to have that information and to, and to stay on top of it. I think it's responsible for us to do this. Um, and it is something that our constituents desperately want. Further discussion. Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Mario. Thank you. Um, you know, I agree with some of the comments that, um, my colleagues have mentioned. I'll just say I've. I've been on council for four years plus, and I've never seen a resolution written like like this. Like the the loaded language, um, this is gonna be like official resolution, like the growing wave of crime. Like it just, it feels very loaded and uh, very fear mongering. Like, what does that even mean? We're talking about data solutions, you know, data driven solutions, but even just the way that this resolution is written is very much, it is not that. Um, so I, I'm very skeptical that that is at all the the actual intent. Instead, we're just blaming, yeah, this feels like an, an, an opinion piece. We're blaming state elected officials who, um, you know, I think Council Members of Onik, uh, addressed all three chambers of our state government, which, you know, are, are controlled by a particular uh, party. So when we say um, that local elections and that city council is not partisan, this is effectively making that partisan. Like this is a growing trend with um, this this newly elected council. And I'm, I'm just very concerned. Um, additionally, um, just with my qualms with like how poorly this is written, um, why is there a, re uh, uh, a section that is waiving the um, the reconsideration for this thing. Um, I, I mean, it's a resolution. Um, it's not even an ordinance. I don't. I also feel that's either poorly written or like there's some. I'm just concerned that that's a precedent we're sending setting. Like, oh, we're not going to discuss this again. Or you know, usually waivers of re uh, reconsideration are for things that are that need to happen now for one technical reason or another, but this is a, a statement of a direction, not an actual policy. So 
I, I'm concerned that there's a waiver of reconsideration. I, we're removing that in, built into this policy. Further discussion? Mayor. Uh, Council Member Zavonik. Yeah, um, Council Member Murillo, I wish you had as much concern about the waiver of reconsideration as you did, and you'd have that kind of um, concern about public safety in our city, because that's why I did it, is that we have to start, this needs to start now, not in two weeks, not in a week. We need to have an intentional focus on solving crime. And and, and I understand, I know what you're saying, that I mentioned all three branches of government, and they happen to be controlled by the same party. I don't care. I know that there were people of my party who voted for some of these offender-friendly laws that are in the books. I don't care who, what party they were. They made our city less safe. They made our state less safe, and it's not acceptable. Um, we have to have a proactive approach to addressing public safety in our city. Our constituents are demanding it. Your constituents, I know, are demanding it um, because you just look at where a lot of the crime is taking place. Um, I, we just got an email right before this meeting about a constituent of yours and the challenges that they're facing with public safety. We need to do something. We need to take action, and we need to show our constituents that we're doing it in a thoughtful uh, in a thoughtful way and being updated on a monthly basis. This isn't about partisan politics. This is public safety isn't partisan. It is when you grandstand and, and you make, um, and what we've seen over the past two years is just that. We've seen people play politics um, instead of prioritizing public safety. And I understand Council Member Coombs said, well, this year the legislature and the governor are doing things. I understand that. The polling has suggested it's time to act. We've been saying we need to act long before an election year, but that shouldn't matter. Public safety should always be the top priority of local government. Mayor. Uh, council Member Mario, and then I'm going to get a sense of the council. Yeah, uh, Council Member Zavonik, you mentioned polling. If I'm, if I'm correct, polling is a political tool that people use to gauge um, and to uh, implement certain policies, get certain people elected. So Please, I mean, when, when when you say this is not partisan, you're already talking about the potential partisan process you've engaged in um, and the data you've seen in polling um, to be able to talk about this. So I, you're right, law enforcement safety is not partisan, but the way that you have um, literally singled out the Democratic legislature um, as the reason, you're saying that is the reason that um, we are experiencing this, quote, crime wave in Colorado. Um, it is the, let's see, is large part a result of the policies passed by state lawmakers. Again, that's, that is not informed by data, that is opinion. You are making, I'm concerned that you are making this partisan. You can shake your head all you want, but you're literally talking about different political tools the language that you've used in this resolution is very loaded, is directed in such a way that um, is is describing a very partisan um, opinion of yours. And yeah, we this should be a top priority. And I, I, I imagine that you had that talking point about, uh, you know, I wish you prioritized public safety as much as the waiver of reconsideration. Again, this is a resolution not having that waiver of reconsideration doesn't mean that our staff doesn't immediately get to work on issues and that we haven't already started to do that. So that that was uh, an interesting statement. Again, that, that I don't think that's a precedent we should be sending, setting, um, that we are just flat out going to remove any and all opportunity to revisit policy by just including that as part of, of the actual policy. That, that concerns me, um, and I've seen that maneuver in past city council meetings. We shut down discussion, we shut down dissent, um, and I don't think that's a precedent we should be setting. Um, is there opposition to moving item 3B forward? Mayor. Uh, council Member McConnell. Uh, I oppose, not because of the public safety concerns, but because of the whereas clauses and the redundancy in section six. McConnell opposed. Uh, further opposition to moving item number 3B forward? Mayor. Council Member Okay. Uh, partisan politics, not because of public safety. Uh, further um, opposition. Um, Dina, just on, I, I just think we need more community engagement in this piece as well. All right. 
Um, I have um, uh, Councilmember Morio, Councilmember Medina, uh, Councilmember Connell, Councilmember Coombs in opposition. Is anybody else in opposition to moving item 3B forward? Seeing no further opposition, item number 3B will move forward. Item number 3C, UDO text amendment ordinance for additional allowances, corrections, and clarifications. Um, staff? Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, City Council. Uh, thank you for your time today. I'll quickly try to share uh, a PowerPoint to walk through the draft ordinance. Uh, my name is Brandon Camerata. I'm a manager in the planning department. Okay. All right. So this is a group of uh, UDO text amendments, and I'll briefly uh, just provide an overview of what's in the draft ordinance and in hopes of uh, bringing it forward to an upcoming council meeting. And so if there's questions, or things that we can look to flesh out between now and then, uh, that would be appreciated. Appreciated. Uh, let's see. Uh, so the UDO, as you all know, is the city's zoning code, uh, subdivision regulations, and codified procedures uh, for the various processes we have. I'm in trouble in that go forward, okay. The UDO uh, applies to the entire city. And so when we're making a text amendment to the UDO, uh, we're following the procedures that are codified in the UDO. And uh, those generally ask that we have a public hearing before the planning commission. Uh, and they make a recommendation to the council. And then the council makes a, a decision on the uh, proposed amendments. And so thus far, um, we have gone and had a public hearing at the Planning Commission in January, and they've recommended approval of this package. Uh, and also in uh, late 2021, uh, we were asked to proceed with this package by the PED committee. So I'll just uh, work through uh, the ordinance. The ordinance uh, kind of follows the chapters that are in the UDO, uh, chapters one through six. And so uh, the first chapter that has some additions in it would be chapter two. Chapter two is where the zone districts themselves are identified and defined. Uh, mostly just code uh, typographical corrections here. The one uh, substantive addition would be uh, an additional allowance in the mixed use district for Green Court, which is uh, a residential product. So adding an additional option for that particular zone district. Moving on to chapter three. And uh, chapter three is basically the land use table. So it describes which land uses are permitted under the various zone districts. Uh, the highlight there would probably be uh, adding daycare facilities to more of our mixed use uh, and uh, industrial districts. Uh, so basically they're permitted in all of those districts except for some of the accident potential zones and things of that sort. Um, Probably the other highlight would be um, modifying our getting rid of some language relating to group homes, which is not enforceable language relating to requiring those homes to register. And then the second component um, in this chapter is relating to in home daycare centers. Uh, the first one I mentioned would be commercial daycare centers. This is in home daycare uh, centers. And this would be in response to um, House Bill 1222, which took effect in September, uh, which asked that um, municipalities uh, basically not allow fewer kids per home, uh, per daycare homes than the state allows. So basically kind of having a more unified approach uh, across municipalities. So basically we're deferring to the state requirements on that one. Uh, 
Another item here, moving on to chapter four, which would be uh, various uh, development standards. And uh, so relating to oil and gas, uh, previously before the UDO, we had a reverse setback. A uh, reverse setback is a distance that new development needs to be from existing oil and gas. So if there's already an oil gas facility, uh, only coming to, in this case, 150 feet of that facility. And so that was uh, adopted by the city council in 2012. And it was part of a much larger ordinance that was in the zoning code to uh, address oil and gas generally. And most of that got moved out, put into the oil and gas menu uh, manual and this little section here should have stayed into the UDO. So we're putting that, uh, requesting that that be put back in. A um, couple of clarifications relating to landscape. Uh, some numbers got transposed and things of that sort. Um, this is a recent uh, addition, uh, the parks, recreation and open space um, kind of ex have expanded their allowance of uh, allowing some dedicated park space, credit for dedication of park space to occur in the, in floodplains. And they worked through that process with the joint task force uh, to, to make those changes in their regulatory manual. And so we're uh, reflecting those changes here. And then uh, lastly, in uh, chapter six, which is our definitions, um, correcting a typo with a uh, daycare facility so that uh, it reads correctly. Uh, and that really concludes uh, my presentation. So thank you for the time. If there's any questions or things we should work on, um, please let us know. Uh, let me start real quick. Let me ask the first one. That is, uh, we have a situation with uh, uh, a Jewish Orthodox uh, synagogue that um, right now they're utilizing office space. That they own two office buildings, I think, and then they have adjacent land that is vacant that they want to build a, a temple on or a synagogue. And uh, they don't, um, they're required by the UDO, they're required to have a standard number of parking spaces. However, given uh, there's a religious requirement that they, uh, during the Sabbath, which is Saturday for them, they um, they have to walk to uh, to uh, service. They, they, they're um, prohibited from driving. Uh, and so I, I just think that there ought, for, there ought to be some type of religious exception uh, for them within the UDO to recognize the, the difference in that religion. A further discussion? Mayor? Uh, Mayor Pertim. Yeah, I have a question on, uh, it was under section five with the group homes. Okay. And you said that, um, so we're we're striking all the language that, that basically says that they have to register with the planning department. And then of course, the second part was the X that they had to be in compliance and couldn't have an expired reg, uh, registration. And so you said that that was not enforceable language and so my question is, they certainly have to follow some kind of guidelines, right? So is it all under the state to be registered? So. Because I don't, I don't think we should have group homes that are not legally registered somewhere. So there's probably, there's a lot of variations to this and, and um, you know, the group homes that we're referring to, uh, it's mentioned FHAA, and so those relate to uh, protected classes. And for the most part, that manifests in, in what people refer to as sober living homes and things of that sort. And what, what court decisions have, have more or less identified is, is that we're required to treat those as, as households and not treat them differently from households. And so part of that is, uh, we're not keeping track of what general households are doing, and so we shouldn't be keeping track of what these households are doing. Um, and so in that sense, you know, that's the premise of, of, of why we're not, not able to enforce this. 
um, language. Now, how are they monitored otherwise? You know, I think right. it varies um, depending on how they're uh, licensed by the state and some variations of that, if they are. Um, you know, I talk a, a lot with Trevor uh, on this as we try to manage this as best we can. Um, you, you know, I think uh, there's some some resources if, 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 for example, at PED or something of that sort where uh, folks could talk about some of the nuance. I mean, people have careers based on <laughs> interpreting these sort of uh, situations. And so um, that could be a possibility moving forward. Uh, to get a little more detail on all the nuance. And I certainly yeah, can't get into it all my here. My concern is there There has to, I mean, if you operate, for example, the sober living home, and I know I have one in my ward um, in the Saddle Rock community, and there have been you know, numerous complaints and so forth, but don't they have to be licensed by somebody? I mean, how do you, how do you say I'm operating a sober living um, facility and not have a license to deal with people that are overcoming addiction. I would think that you'd have to have some medical professional license. Maybe I think that's the case in a lot of, of circumstances. <laughs> and so I, I can certainly provide a little bit of a, a, a written overview when I make the, uh, the, the submittal for, for the, um, for the council regular meeting to try to clarify that aspect of, of things because um, it's not kind of yes or no. Right, right. Okay. And then just quickly on um, the second one was on oil and gas. Mm -hmm. so you said 2012 was right. when it was, is that, it went that far back that we had the reverse setback? Correct. Uh, yeah, I have the ordinance uh, sitting around here, but uh, okay. again, that was kind of my understanding. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, so the, the 150 hasn't changed. Correct. That's the same thought process from 2012. Okay. So it, it's, and this is new development. So if a new develop, if there's an oil operation or the, we're not even operating, but they have the rights to, um, to drill. And then a new development comes in, they must be 150 feet setback from it. Correct. Well, and I would clarify that it's existing facilities, not just rights or ownership uh, of an oil place. So they have to have something built there. And okay. if they do, then that's when this regulation would take in, take effect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Further uh, questions or of staff for discussion? I say none. Is there any objection to, um, to moving item number three B forward? Uh, seeing none out of three B, we'll move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, it's item number three C. Just stand corrected. Item number three C will move forward. Uh, item number three D: Aurora Mobile Response Team Pilot Program Update. Uh, Courtney Tassin. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and Council. Today, I will be providing an update after the Aurora Mobile Response Team pilot has concluded. I do want to preface it and say that these data that we're going to show are still preliminary as we had um, the deadlines for council. So I'll be able to provide some updates as we go along, but just know that on the PowerPoint in your packet, they will not be reflective of the final pilot data. It's not moving. There it goes. So just a brief overview, I know we already have talked about this before, but AMRT is a crisis intervention team that pairs a paramedic from South Rocky Mountain with a licensed mental health professional from Aurora Mental Health. They're operating Wednesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., and we just concluded our pilot phase last week. They're predominantly in Northwest Aurora, but are servicing all of Police District 1. They're only responding to those low-intensity active mental health calls for service. They are unarmed, and they do not fulfill any law enforcement duties, and they won't respond to any calls for service that have a weapon component of active violence to self, others, or property. We do work very collaboratively with our public safety partners to include the Aurora Police Department, specifically the crisis response team, Aurora Fire, and their community health program, as well as South Rocky Mountain. And this team is self-dispatching, so they are using their PD radios as well as their motor docked computers to be able to review calls to triage 
and ensure that they're going on the safest calls. Brief overview of historical information. Um, main things are September 8th is when we fully launched and November of 2020 is when the funds were approved. Our current coverage has one program manager, a licensed clinician and a paramedic from Falk Rocky Mountain. And they are all FTEs. They are working a 40 hour week and they make up one mobile response unit. This is a supplemental request that we are putting through the spring supplemental, so it will be revisited at a later date. I did want to highlight that we have included a 5% dis differential to both salaried staff, excuse me, to both salaried staff to make this position a little more competitive and to help with attrition and any retention efforts. And I'd like to note that we are going to be asking for an additional $157,000 just to get us through 2022. Our initial budget for 2022 was for a six month period as it was duplicated from the pilot phase. So again, we will be revisiting this at a later date and it'll come through the spring supplemental. A little bit of our end of pilot data is at, as of 2-9 of 2022, the team went to 193 calls for service. This is now closer to 215. They've had about 12 emergency department diversions looking at a cost savings of about $49,000. They've needed PD on, uh, sorry, they needed additional PD assistance on zero calls, and we're seeing a cost savings of approximately $15,000. This number is likely much higher as we're looking at the average of time spent on calls, and it doesn't include the outliers. So some of our calls are lasting anywhere to two to three hours. So this is just the average here. And we look at this and we can see that this number would be much higher if the team was able to respond to all of the calls that have been identified as appropriate. And this is again, a code that dispatch created to denote that a call is appropriate, meaning there is no violence or weapons, and it is a mental health call for service. AMRT was able to respond to about 20% of all of those calls, but as of 321, there was about 907 calls for service identified. And these are coming across all hours of the day, as well as across the whole entire city, as you can see through the red flags here. When we're looking at the call times of day, we asked our uh, evaluation partners to create a heat map to show us peak times and peak days. The areas where you're seeing um, no entries, those are also outside of our coverage hours. So the familiarity that this dispatch team has probably much lower. So that's why we assume that there are no calls for service on these specific times and days. You can see that about 8 a.m. all the way down to 6 p.m. is our peak times, and they're really going all across all days of the week, specifically Sunday through Wednesday. We also wanted to provide just a brief suggestion of expansion to look at the future of AMRT in comparison to our current staffing level. If you look in your packet, there are three additional um, options for expansion or suggestions for expansion on the one pager provided. We're also going to revisit this as we're going to hopefully put this through the 2023 budget cycle request. Just to look at what our current staffing looks like and what it could look like if we kept the staffing level, we would again have those three staff, the program manager, licensed clinician, and paramedic. Supplies budgeted would be for vests, radios, MDCs, those motor dock computers, overtime funds, and miscellaneous. And we have the option of a citywide unit or an assigned district. The issue with citywide units is it would be a significantly slower response time as we would have one team that could go from Northwest Aurora all the way down to south, Southlands, which can be a 45 minute drive sometimes with traffic. With assigned district, which is what our current operating model is, the team would continue to work Wednesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to eight and would remain in district one. If we're looking at an optimized citywide coverage option, this would include six teams. We would have three on one half of the week and three on the other half. And again, we have citywide versus assigned district options. Now this model would include six licensed clinicians, one program manager, six paramedics. And within both of those professionals, we would have two leads to ensure that everyone's remaining in compliance. We would also include a case manager and a peer specialist. The supplies budgeted would be the same as it was for the one team response. So with the citywide units, it would be one unit per shift. So we would have one unit for days, swings and graves, and that would operate again on both halves of the week, providing a 24 seven coverage, but would 
result in significantly slower response time. For our assigned district options, it would be, again, both halves of the week would be covered, but we would have one unit per district for all for the same shift hours. So this would look something like this. <laughs> if we have our citywide coverage, we see here we would have one unit for day shift, one unit for swings, and one for graves for both halves of the week. Now for our assigned district options, we would have one unit per district, Sunday through Wednesday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., and then one unit per district, Wednesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, questions to staff? Mayor. Uh, Mayor Patel. Um, thank you for the presentation. On the, um, the program manager um, with the salary of 109,000, that's a city employee? Correct, that is my position and I believe that includes benefits <laughs> okay. as well. And do you do you also manage the co-responder model? Is that or or is that completely managed through the police department? As of right now, the crisis response team does not have a program manager. We are discussing options to assist with their program management as well. Okay, and then on the when you show that chart with all the times uh, with calls, the, it, the pink and yellow and yeah. Oops. Um, this one? Yes, perfect. So the calls that are, because you guys go till 8 p.m. So the calls that were after 8 p.m., help me with that. Who, yes. were those just that came in that weren't responded to or they were responded to differently? So it could be both. So these numbers here come from this here. So 907 calls that were identified were spread out, <clears throat> excuse me, among this chart here. So this was just the analysis of all of the hashtag AMRT, which is the code that dispatch created. Okay. And then on, uh, you said that you guys responded to 20% of the calls that came in. So Correct. the 80%, did they go to the co-responder model or did, or they just, like, what happened to those calls? That's a good question. Thank you for asking that. So it could be a variety. It could be patrol. It could have been canceled or it could have gone to the co-responder model. Now, we didn't quite look at that analysis itself, but most of these calls likely went to patrol. Okay. All right. Thank you. Further questions? Mayor. Mayor. Okay. Council Member Lawson. Hi, Courtney. Thank you. I have a, a question, a couple questions for you. So um, with Right now, I know with the if this program if we continue with the funding of it, will you be able to go back and actually kind of see how some of the individuals are doing that you actually looked at? Because it seems like that might be a one gap, and I know people might consistently call, but I'm just wondering if you're able to go back and check on the individuals if that may help and maybe kind of decrease the call sometimes from maybe possibly the same individual. Thank you for asking that. And that is such a huge part of crisis response is that case management aspect. And you're absolutely right that that is a huge gap in this program right now. As of right now, we just have the one clinician and one paramedic. If we were able to expand, we would add a case manager and a peer specialist who would respond um, after that initial contact and provide any additional resources and help navigate the system. So that could be applying for vouchers, it could be applying for Medicaid, it could just be getting involved in additional behavioral health services. Uh, I, uh, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, Mayor, I'm sorry, you can go ahead. I've just had a follow-up question, another question. Well, I just I, just to follow up on uh, you know, Council Member Lawson's point, I went out with a crisis responses team before, and a big part of what they do is that follow-up, is that case management, is uh, making that referral to, um, you know, Aurora Mental Health or other uh, uh, the service providers. I mean, that is uh, so incredibly important, and, and I'm not sure what you're accomplishing without that. Um, Count, Councilmember Lawson. Um, and then my question, second question is, you know, I'm for also for the co-responder program. Um, even when I went to the state legislature and obtained a Pfizer, I was supportive of that. I guess this is the question that I want to go back to. Um, I, you know, I this program is valuable, and I also see the co-responder program valuable. And I always ask that question. The intent of this program eventually is not to replace the co-responder. They should be able to exist together because I see the need of both. Is that correct? Yes, Council Member Lawson, that's absolutely correct. And as a former member of the crisis response team, I'm also a little biased too. 
Um, but I think in order to maintain both the safety and expand the capacity of any kind of crisis response, we need both teams. Because if my team is feeling pressured to respond to violent calls just because there's a mental health component and there's no other option, we're going to have some concerns on my end, at least when we're looking at quality assurance. So I think an evidence based practices also show that these programs work best in collaboration and even Denver star program has a law enforcement co responder model that complements it. Further discussion. Mayor. Mayor. Sorry. Um... Is it Councilman McConnell? Yes, thank you, sir. And thank you, Courtney, for the presentation um, and for all the information you provided for us. Um, I don't really have any questions for you. I just want to say that I think you all have done a great job. Um, I think that there's a lot of merit to this program. Uh, I appreciate that it helps us relieve pressure uh, from APD and ensure that we're sending the right response out. Uh, and I'm also very relieved to hear that you all have not put yourselves in dangerous situations, that you're always acutely aware of avoiding that. Uh, and I agree that I think there is still use for the uh, the crisis response team model as well. But um, I'm hoping that we can um, get a consensus here to, you know, get you all to a citywide uh, level and get that funding, because I think this is a really valuable program that will pay a lot of dividends, um, you know, in terms of quality of response uh, for the city long into the future. So thank you. I just want to ask a quick question, um, Courtney, and that is with this uh, expansion, you will be able to do the some some level of follow up. Am I correct? Correct, sir. That is one of the main focuses on the next phase of expansion, if allowed, is that case management aspect with a peer specialist. Okay, um, Mayor uh, Councilmember Zavonik. Yeah, Courtney. Thanks. Oh, one of the questions I have. Um, as you look at potentially expanding, but also the integration with the crisis response team, um, what, how how could that potentially change the math if there's greater integration there and maybe shared resources among the clinician? And again, with an idea that you have a shared pool of clinicians and as the calls come in, the, the determining factor is, is the clinician, is it violent and they're hopping in a car with a, an APD officer or they hopping in a car with a medic based on, again, the type of response they need, but maybe getting some economies of scale um, and having, you know, the clinicians as a shared resource between the mobile response team and the crisis response team. And, and again, um, responding appropriately based on the call. That is something that we are actually looking to um, figure out the logistics to implement because that is also what Denver does with their STAR program and their law enforcement co-responder model. They have a pool of clinicians who are assigned to a home base, the law enforcement program or the STAR model, and they are able to pick up shifts for the other team and they're trained in all of the modalities. So that is something that I am actually working collaboratively with CRT and Housing Community Services Upper Management to see if we can figure out what that looks like. Further uh, uh, questions, comments? Sunberg. Uh, Council Member Sunberg. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, when I had spoken to CRT a while back, they were having some challenges with staffing of the mental health clinicians. Have you found that to be a challenge also? So as of right now, we again only have that one space and it was actually filled prior to my hiring. So I can't speak to if this program specifically has had the issue. I will say that there is a clinician shortage across the state right now and across the country. There's approximately a thousand vacancies for clinicians across the state. So I think it's something to anticipate. But I also believe that the way that we are looking to move forward with, especially the hazard pay and the differentials, we'll hopefully see a, a lessened staffing uh, concern. But that is something that we are trying to anticipate and be proactive about. Further discussion? Questions? The seeing none, is there any objection to moving item number 3D forward? The seeing no objection, item number 3D will move forward. Thank you for the presentation. Mayor. Item number three. Um, I'm sorry. It's Marcano. My apologies. I just wanted to ask, I thought that we needed to choose an option, or are we going to do that, I guess, at the regular meeting? Um, Courtney, what's your preference? I believe at this time, and Jessica, please hop in if I'm incorrect, I believe at this time we're not looking at any decision making regarding the options, but we did okay. want to provide you with some context of what that looks like to help okay. inform it later. So this was just information only, if I understand Correct. this. Okay, very well. Thank you. Mayor, and Mayor, the, the additional for 2022 will come through the spring supplemental process, and then any expansion for 2023 would come through the budget process for 2020. Okay. So at this point, yes, informational. Thank you. 
Uh, item number three, E. Shelt. Um, well, uh, the time is now uh, 729. Uh, council will stand at recess until 735. Council is in recess.
135, council is back in session. Um, Short-term sheltering option, housing and community services. Um, uh, please proceed. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Lana Dalton. I'm the city, city's manager of homelessness and behavioral health. On be February 28th, 2022, city council passed a resolution expressing council support to have sufficient shelter options for individuals and families in an unauthorized camp. Staff was then instructed to provide a presentation with an overview of short-term shelter options. Each solution includes a breakdown of initial costs to become operational, annual staffing and operational costs, the number of individuals the option can serve, cost of per person per day, congregate or non-congregate, and the timeline to become operational. One thing to note is that none of these options have been vetted by our current service providers who would be providing the services related to these programs. So, to go ahead and get started. We have a few different options for you. Uh, hotel motel vouchers, operating the ADRC or the Aurora Day Resource Center 24 seven year round. We have heated ice fishing tents, pallet shelters and a leased warehouse, which would be a temporary solution. Um, all of this information is in your backup. So I do know there are a lot of numbers and a lot of things of that nature. So if you have additional questions, feel free to ask those um, as it relates to the numbers. I have some of those answers for you. Um, for hotel motel vouchers, um, this is based, this $60 a night uh, per night per room is based on a 75 person room block that we would have to purchase through a hotel or motel uh, for 30 days. And so I know that's kind of complicated, but $60 per night per room for a 75 person block uh, for, for 30 days. Um, if you look at annual staffing and supply costs, I'll get into that in a little bit to a little bit more, but it's about 2.1 million dollars to operate that and that is per year. Uh, it shelters about 150 people, which brings the cost to about 6863 a day. This is a non congregate option. So when we're talking about congregate versus non congregate, um, according to the state regulations, as it relates to COVID-19, those congregate sheltering options uh, and non congregate sheltering options are still in place where you have to have six feet apart. If we were, ha if we had, you know, say a bunch of people in a room together that were sharing a space. Um, and so that is why I'm listing the non congregate versus congregate uh, category on these um, on these options. Uh, about one to two months to become operational. That's primarily because obviously we would have to talk to our service provider, providers, staff, um, get staffing for all of this, and that could take some time. And is there opportunity to leverage other resources uh, for this specific model? No, there is not. Oops. Um, so staffing and supply costs for hotel motels. Um, if you're looking at, you have to have overnight security, that would be about $600,000. Um, when we were operating the emergency shelter, it was about $10,000 per week. Again, that is not 24 seven, that is just for overnights. Um, it would have staff of 1.2 million, that includes a manager, 15 care navigators, which are five people per shift. There's three shifts, it's five case managers, which would have about 15 people per caseload. Those folks are very important to help individuals move through the service system in order to get housed. Uh, food costs, supplies, and transportation are all listed there as well for annual staffing and supply costs of about $2.1 million per year. Um, looking at the ADRC, um, open 24 seven year round, I will mention that uh, we do activate on cold weather nights, that's 20 degrees and below, um, and or there's additional precipitation that would uh, possibly um, prevent somebody from, you know, remaining uh, outside. So the initial cost to become operational for the ADRC is 750,000. The annual staffing and supply cost would be 1.3 million. This would accommodate about 75 people. Again, because this is a congregate option, we have to still abide by state guidelines and therefore we have to um, have appropriate spacing amongst the individuals in, the, in this specific setting. The cost per person per day would be $76.71. Um, again, like I said, it's a congregate option and it would take about one to two months again for staffing. Um, we are lucky with the ADRC. We do have staff there during the day, but we would still need to hire staff at night in order to accommodate this option. And there are no additional opportunities to leverage other resources for this option. Uh, staffing. 
staffing and supply costs, yeah. Uh, overnight security, again, would be about $600,000. The care navigators, food and supplies um, for 1.3 million. Uh, heated ice fishing tents. So these are the tents that we had at the emergency shelter last year. These are the tents that are currently up at Restoration Christian Ministries. Um, and the initial cost to become operational is about $500,000. Um, I know the mayor had gone and seen uh, some of the safe outdoor spaces at uh, Colorado Village Collaborative. This is equivalent to that. Um, it also includes, we would have to have a, a shower trailer uh, option as well um, to serve these, these outdoor options. And so that cost is also included in the initial cost to become operational. Uh, annual staffing and supply costs, $1.4 million per year. Again, that includes care navigators, case management, um, housing navigators, things of that nature, a manager. Um, how many people does that shelter? 30 to 60. The average that we see currently is about 45. So that's how I got to the cost of $118.72 per day. This again is a non-congregate option because people are separated. Uh, how long to take to become operational is about two months. And is there the opportunity to, to leverage other resources at this time? No. Um, again, this breaks down the supply and staffing costs based upon the current um, the current models that we have now. Um, and again, includes the shower trailer option as well in here to provide hygiene to those folks that would be on this site. Pallet shelters, um, initial cost to become operational $1.1 million. And this is about 30 uh, pallet shelters. This includes all the infrastructure that would be associated with putting the pallet shelters together, pulling the electric, all of that type of stuff. Um, annual costing cost for supplies and staffing is 1.4. It uh, accommodates 30 to 60 people. Again, the average is 45, so that's about $158 per day. This is a non-congregate option, and it would take about two to three months to put together, and there are no opportunities to leverage other resources at this time. And again, the breakdown of those staffing slash supply costs for this specifically. And again, it includes the shower trailer in order to accommodate hygiene. And then the last option is a leased warehouse. Again, this would be temporary. Um, we would not purchase the warehouse um, as we would be renting it. And I base these numbers on the emergency shelter um, option that we had uh, a year ago or so. Um, the initial cost to become operational is about $2.5 million. The annual staffing and supply cost is about 2.4. This would accommodate about 125 people, depending upon the size of the warehouse, of course. But I chose that number because that's a little bit more than what we served at the emergency shelter last year. Um, the cost is about $108 per day. It's a congregate option, so we would need to have appropriate spacing. And how long would it take to become operational? Uh, six to eight months, based upon the ability to, again, make sure the infrastructure inside of the warehouse is adequate and to make sure that there was, um, we had the time to staff up. Again, these are the staffing costs, um, the security, the care navigators, case management, shower trailer programming food supplies and transportation. You will notice there are transportation in some of these options and not others. The reason is, is because if we had to transport an individual to a place to stay, um, that those options include transportation. And again, those costs are based upon what it costed at the emergency shelter the last time we, we, uh, we had that in place. And then this uh, breaks it down for total costs. And so you will you can see that all of them across the board on uh, what this looks like. And then the total cost for one year. Um, these are not in order, obviously, from cheapest to most expensive. They're in order from quickest to execute to the longest to execute. Um, so you can kind of look at those. Um, like I said, there are no leveraging opportunities currently for any of these options, and they, they vary in the months that it would take to set these up. Um, and that is my presentation. I'm happy to take any additional questions, and I'll leave this one up here because I feel like it's a good reference point for folks if um, you have additional questions as well. Yeah, Mayor. Let me start, I, I'm going to start with some questions. And that is, first of all, so we've in last time during the well during the height of the pandemic, uh, when we had a winter shelter, uh, what we did is we used a day resource center during the day, um, and then we used the um, 
so the food service, all the food service and the, the navigators the, and everything was at the day resource center as it is today. And then transported to a, a warehouse type shelter where the only modification was that a um, shower trailer uh, with bathrooms uh, was placed inside the um, the warehouse. And so what what was the the cost to um, set up that operate the warehouse part of that? Because it did because I didn't see any any modifications that were done outside of the fact that you had a shower trailer inside. Sure. And that was an emergency solution to that specific issue that needed to be put together um, pretty pretty rapidly. Um, and so what I would say is there it was two parts. The city paid for a portion of it and the other portion um, was all completed through Comitis. And so all of those staff were hired on in addition to their regular staff to do the overnight staffing. Security was brought on and that was the cost. Um, it was about, I believe, $2.5 million and correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, for um, to get that up and running and to, to sustain it for about three months. Mayor Lane is correct. There was some minor modifications inside, kind of set up some temporary kitchens in there. Um, there weren't any kitchens. In, there weren't. There were kitchens in the day resource center, but there were not kitchens in the shelter. Right, not in, a in the overnight just, shelter. Yep, the e shelter just had things like refrigerators and microwaves and things like that. So yeah. there was, I think, a couple hundred thousand dollars of supplies purchased to yeah, get additional yeah. mats and things like that. Um, to accommodate, uh, but mostly it was just, um, you know, the the portalettes outside, shower trailer inside, and then um, the staffing costs and security. You know, I, I don't see how you need navigators and I, other thing for nighttime. I don't think see how you need anything but security. Yeah, it was my understanding, Mayor, that you were looking for a 24-7 option for individuals to go to and stay at during the day. It wasn't my understanding that they would be staying at the ADRC during the day and then being transported like at the emergency okay, shelter. Okay, it could be either way. It could be either way, whatever's more cost effective. But um, there, but under no scenario did I envision that there would be case managers there at night and navigators there at night. No. Mayor, they wouldn't be there at night. They would be there during the day, and then you'd have you'd have to have staff there to monitor the situation in addition to security at night as well. So that's configured in the case managers would be working a regular forty hour work week at the at the shelter itself. Okay. Uh, uh, discussion. Mayor. Mayor. Uh, Mayor Patel. Um. Yeah, I'm looking at um, when you have the hotel motel on there. Um, that is for renting an entire motel, correct? That is rent for renting a block of rooms. So it's not necessarily a whole hotel. Right, a block of rooms. Okay. Um, I mean, that one doesn't make any sense to me. It's very costly. Um, you know, you've got to have the security, the staffing, the food, the supplies, transportation, and you're not able to really monitor people in their in the rooms. Um, so, you know, there could be some uh, some severe security issues happening, um, you know, within the, within that. But we still would have the hotel vouchers available, right? For like just one here and there where we need to give a hotel voucher to some, a family. So we only use hotel motel vouchers on cold weather activations because all other sheltering options have to be full in order for us to execute on those because of the way that the federal guidelines are written and we use HUD dollars for that. Okay, but we still have that option during cold weather. Yes. Okay, and then the other uh, point I wanted to make is um, on the transportation, do we not have two outreach vans that we purchased with two or three, I can't remember. We do have outreach vans that we purchased um, for for outreach specifically and for transportation to and from the ADRC to the emergency shelter. Uh, those are used seven days a week by our, our current street outreach workers that are out um, going out into encampments and such. Right. And so 
that would be, it, it could possibly be an option, um, but I will say that would take away from the actual outreach that they could be doing in the community if they were transporting people on a daily basis. Right. Right. They're, they're mostly going, I mean, I read those reports we get and mostly the outreach vans are going to the encampments. I mean, there's sometimes one here or one there, but a lot of times it's to the encampments. I was just thinking it was just a good use of trying to share that resource and maybe cut down on some of the transportation costs. Um, then also on the least warehouse, which I think is a good idea. So I think a, I think the day resource center is optimal in terms of, you know, the, the cost per person. Uh, we already have staff there. We have a lot of the resources there. So I think that's really the best option. And then if we go to a least warehouse, you had on there, there there's no way to leverage monies. Why is that? Because it would be a temporary solution to, um, this is a leased warehouse. It's not a purchase that the city would be um, making. And so- So there's no way to get county monies to leverage with it? The counties to contribute? I, I'm sure we could ask. Um, however, we are looking for a longer term solution, which we will be presenting on on April 4th in regards to more of a permanent- right. Um, which no, we're I, I understand this is just short term, but in the short term, you know, we do have two counties that do have health and human services. I say it all the time that you would think could contribute some monies towards this, you know, one of these solutions, even if it is temporary. I, I just think we should, you know, we should use some of that to, uh, and leverage our, our monies that way. Um, so this is just the least option to purchase a warehouse. You're going to, that would be something you guys could look at for down the road. Correct. For the permanent. Correct. Yep. Okay. Be and if we were to do, so if we were to do the day resource center, um, and then use some of our you, uh, current tents and pallets at the different Salvation Army and at the Restoration Church, um, then we could look at a leased warehouse as well, kind of to, I know it takes a little bit longer to get to that point. So Mayor Pro Tem, just, just so you're aware, the pallet shelters that are currently being executed on as well as the ice fishing tents are full. And so those are already filled with individuals from uh, encampments in the surrounding area. Okay. I just wrote down that you said 45 people were in the, in the pallet homes and it can take 30 to 60. Correct, because they are they can hold up to two individuals at any given time. But if they are single individuals, they will be allowed to stay in in the pallet shelter alone. Okay, and the tents we have how many of those tents currently? Uh, right now we have about twenty five, um, and those are full as well. And they have approximately, I, I believe it's anywhere between forty and forty five individuals in those as well. Okay, so I thought we we um, bought the same amount of tents as the same amount of pallets. That's what I remember from when we authorized the monies that we were splitting at 50-50. You are correct. And uh, because of the a short a lifespan of a, an, of a tent and it going through the weather, we have lost several of those uh, tents because of the weather. Okay, all right, thanks. As far as inside the tent, further questions? Mayor. Mayor. Uh, Council Member McConnell. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm curious, we have really great breakdowns here on in terms of cost, uh, which I very much appreciate, but I want to know about efficacy as well. Um, how many folks, um, I guess, let me phrase it this way, we're already doing all of this here. So what do the success rates look like for transitioning folks out of homelessness for each of these options? Do you have that data available as well? Um, I don't have that data off the top of my head. What I can say is that um, with the pallet shelters and the ice fishing tents with the wraparound services that are connected to those, those current programs, we are having good success with getting individuals transitioned into housing and connected to other services like county services, um, behavioral health services, things of that nature. Uh, the ADRC uh, becomes a little tricky because you have to have that movement outward every day. So even though they can stay in the building, 
um, for day services, they still have to gather all of their things and move themselves out so the day services can move in, if you will. And so um, kind of like our cold weather sheltering option right now, same type of thing. They may not stay as connected as you would see somebody who's actually staying at one of these other facilities. Um, hotel motel vouchers, as long as you have those wraparound services and are checking on individuals on a regular basis, usually have some high efficacy there. And then the leased warehouse, again, it could have the same type of, um, if it had the same type of services, I could see it doing very well as well. Thank you. Are there uh, uh, questions? Mayor? Uh, Councilmember Coombs. Um, yeah, so following up on that, it looks to me if we look at the per person per day cost that the hotel motel vouchers is the most cost effective and fastest non congregate option that we have available. And then similarly, the ADRC is the most cost effective and fast to implement congregate option that we have available. So that seems to me like we could, we should look at those factors. And so if we're saying all other things being equal, they're equally effective. You said maybe the ADRC is less effective because people have to move their things out. Um, but so all other things being equal, it seems like we should look at the quick to implement and cost effective solutions. Um, so that's what I would support. Um, would be the hotel motel vouchers and the ADRC open 24 seven um, in those options. Cause actually the hotel motel vouchers are not more expensive. Do we have any reason to believe that the security issues are worse at the hotel and motel sites than at pallet shelters or fishing tent shelters? Sure. Um, due to the sheer quantity of individuals that we could possibly house at a hotel motel, there could be that. Um, uh, it's my understanding there's been some experiences in the past that um, haven't worked out with hotel motel vouchering here in the past. Um, I wasn't part of those discussions, so I would open it up to anybody else. But um, And then with the ADRC, um, we originally had a, a lower count amount on the actual people that could be in there just because it, um, due to the not having a lot of security there currently, it's been a problem for some, you know, violent acts and things of that nature. So they wanted to minimize it as much as possible to ensure safety for everybody that is at the facility currently. And let me just um, say that uh, they're going to have, obviously security is going to be a big part of it. And it's going to have to, um, if, if we go the ADRC and I think it's the, uh, I think we should go for that first and then see how it goes and then look at uh, one of these other options after that fact. Uh, but but we can turn it in 24, uh, 24 hour facility, uh, seven days a week, um, food services there, everything's there. I mean, we're gonna have to have services to augment that, um, but, um, that, but it's all there. And so my suggestion would be to start with that and then uh, to then revisit this because uh, that's going to be the quickest thing to stand up and then revisit it, revisit it if necessary, probably will be necessary for a secondary option. Mayor. Uh, Council Member Mario. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for putting this kind of matrix together. Um, I, um, I, a couple of things. I, I would be interested in exploring a congregate and a non-congregate option since we know that that not everyone um, is going to fit like the, you know, like, like I think of the dogs, for example, like it's difficult for people and to enter a congregate shelter because of, you know, a particular family circumstance, they don't want to, you know, bring their kids to a congregate shelter. So I, I like the idea of exploring both the congregate and non congregate option. I think that might just give folks just the option as opposed to like, just Fully investing in one option, and then um, we we wouldn't know, you know, the types of people who just are going to refuse or just choose not to seek that service because it's just not a, a an option for their family circumstance. Um, I do think that we should lean on our um, or our day resource center um, since that's a organization we currently work with. Um, the point about its kind of efficacy, um, you know, I don't think that should be the only 
kind of outlet just because they are, I mean, unless we do do it 24 um, seven, but currently I guess as, as is um, having to kind of move out every day, I think isn't providing the best um, continuity for folks. Um, in terms of the hotel motel vouchers, um, I know that's something we do now. I, if we're gonna do like a non-congregate option, kind of a room, cause I, you know, a hotel room or motel room versus a pallet shelter is, is kind of like a similar concept in my mind, just like your own space. Um, I, don't, I guess I'm concerned that we can't do quality control on a hotel or motel. Um, so I like the idea of kind of deferring to either the um, pallet, shel pallet shelter or fishing tent. That being said, just the useful life of the the tents has um, been shared to be a problem. Um, so I think then I would defer to kind of the pallet shelter option. So I would say, if is there a possibility um, to explore um, a congregate and a non-congregate option um, as we move forward? And I guess it's just a question to the group, but I think there's merit both ways. And we do wanna focus on, you know, kind of, Things, doing things as soon as possible as well. If, if I could follow up on um, Council Member Murillo's um, uh, issue, and that is, um, are there, I, I suspect that there are individuals like families, as she mentioned, although Comitus is principally for families, but if that's full, um, and if there's a family, um, wouldn't we be able to place them in a, even though we don't have a block of motel rooms, wouldn't we be able to place them in a motel? If all of their sheltering options were full. So if we had additional ADRC availability and we also had some hotel motel vouchers, we would have to wait until all of the ADRC slots were filled prior to putting a family into a hotel motel. Lana. Uh, I don't understand why, yeah, I understand. Uh, why that I would just, be, yeah. I'm sorry, who would like to see? To yeah, Jessica. Just Prosser. Yeah, so if we're not using HUD funds, then we would not have to follow that uh, that procedure. So right now when we're using HUD funds on cold nights, we have to have all other shelter options full. If we were using other funding sources, which we most likely will for these options, um, we would not have to follow that um, procedure. So we could put a family in a hotel. Uh, the point is if we don't have a block of rooms, then we are just sort of taking a gamble that there would be space um, at one of the hotels that we work with uh, on a regular basis. We can have some pre-negotiated rates with them, um, but we wouldn't have the guarantee of that rooms if we don't have the, um, the block. And so um, we would just have have to make sure that you know we have enough hotels to be able to call on to find that family a room. Okay, it would be a much smaller block if it was just a supplement, a secondary versus a primary. Okay, uh, good point, uh, Council Member Mario. Thank you. Um, I I did want to just follow up on that on that bit. How do we? Because I'm sure we've heard horror stories about different like hotel or motel rooms not necessarily being the most cleanly when we, you know, so can you talk a little bit about, um, about kind of the quality control versus like a hotel versus like a, a pallet shelter? Council Member Rio, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, so many hotels go through our systematic housing inspection each year, actually through our department in code enforcement. And so, um, there are certainly, uh, you know, different different levels of uh, what hotel and motels um, are like uh, within the city. And so the hotels that we typically work with uh, for vouchering on cold nights, um, there is some quality control there. And, you know, we feel like they're okay for fam families and individuals. Um, so that is something we would look at. Um, and then also from the hotel's perspective, making sure that rooms, you know, are left the way they were found as well. That's the other thing that hotels um, are very concerned for to block so they can, you know, have some insurance and agreements and stuff like that. Okay, uh, further discussion? 
Mayor, I did just have one more. Oh, uh, Councilmember Mario. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, and my internet's going slow, so my video is off. Um, thank you for answering that. On the pallet shelters, um, was that the option with the um, shower truck and everything? Um, I recall that the Aurora warms the night has a an asset similar to you know has a shower truck. Have we talked to them about potentially? using that asset for um, any of these options? Um, they do have that asset. Um, we have not discussed with Aurora Worms tonight. We no longer contract with that agency at this point in time. Uh, for, and l let me just say, I think that the number of 75 is a little understated for, I think that the capacity is 150, but I get um, uh, pandemic rules, although at the last time, I went, well, I was at the um, ADRC last week for the service for the um, uh, the, the uh, homeless individual, unfortunately, had passed away that was well known uh, in the ADRC. And so um, there were no um, uh, social distancing guidelines or mass requirements uh, in the facility when I was there. Further, further discussion. Mayor, Mayor Sundberg. Councilmember Sumber. A couple of questions for you. Thank you, Lana and Jessica. First is re with respect to staffing. Second, with uh, energy costs to heat those things. Um, with respect to annual staffing costs, caseworkers, care negotiators, navigators, how active are they with uh, homeless clients with respect to rehabilitation and recovery as needed and job training, getting them out back into the into the world, such as like housed, working, and healthy, that organization does. Sure. So, with each one of the with the pallet shelters and the heated tents, currently our operator is Salvation Army. They partner with Stride Healthcare. They partner with Aurora Mental Health. They partner with several other behavioral health providers, and um, with it and. Uh, I think ready to work as well as BAD in, in regards to getting individuals connected to services for um, for work and for health and all of those other reasons. And so those, when I say that these individuals work with case managers, they work with case managers on a daily basis in order to rapidly transition into other entities. And that's why the model works so well is because you have people that are checking in on these individuals daily rather than coming in in a large quantity and then you know, it's just very, um, there's not as many case managers to client ratio. And so you see better outcomes when individuals um, have a case manager that they can re rely on on a daily basis to check in with and get connected to services with. Okay, thank you. And then I had heard before the high cost of heating the pallet shelters and tents. Is that cost built in here? It is, so it is uh, It is um, connected. So it depends on which way you go about it. So I was made aware of a new option that Colorado Village Collaborative does where they tie into the actual Excel poll somehow. Again, I'm a social worker, I don't do electricity. <laughs> um, but uh, so that was an option rather than using generators. And so that could be a lower cost option as well. Okay, thanks. Mayor? Uh, Mayor Patim. Yeah, I had a question on the um, pallet homes because you going back to 45 people being in there currently, um, I thought they were only allowed to be in there for 90 days. Is that right? So it's 45 people that are averaging in there. Uh -huh. Yeah. And they can be there for 90 days or more. That's what we're seeing on a, on a pretty regular basis of people transitioning out into other into other entities. Some take a little bit longer, some take shorter. So, so do you hold them to the 90 days? No, they're not held to any time frame. That is the average length of stay at the pallet shelters themselves. Okay, I th I thought when we approved it that we we had said that they were not to be permanent, they were only temporary and they were gonna be taken down. I know that was one of the selling points is they're, oh, they're easy to take down. So are we, we're not taking them down at all, ever? Not at this specific moment in time. I think we're looking at additional shelter capacity in general and that adds to that capacity. Okay. And so, yeah. But 
but I thought there was a time frame. They can't stay in there for a year, right? The individuals? Right. Correct. They wouldn't be staying in there for a year. What we're seeing is an average of 90 days. Okay. Can we get the um, the actual data on that per individual? As far as each individual, how long each person how long each person has stayed in there? Sure. Okay. Um, and then on the what was my question on the back here? Um, yeah, I guess I agree with the mayor on the capacity for the day resource center because I think. Um, isn't it, isn't it going to end with, I don't know if it's from the health department that they put that requirement in for these kind of facilities to still have the social distancing when the state, the governor has released that for every business and. Correct. So it's when the state would release that, um, re release that requirement for shelters specifically that that would no longer be in play for the Aurora Resource Center. Okay. okay, and then in the summertime, do you, do you see do you see a change in how people might go in these different options? Um, I think you see with unsheltered uh, folks that live rough on the streets and whatnot, they like to have their own space. They don't go to shelter on purpose because of safety concerns and things of that, or they've had a poor experience. And so, right. having that individualized. Um, space for themselves makes a lot of sense. And so they're more apt to go into one of those non congregate type uh, options. Yeah. And then on the hotel, because I remember when we did the respite motel and we did have some, I think it was that one where we had some issues, but I think, you know, for families, it makes sense for us to be able to, um, to refer them to a motel. Um, but I, I, I think there are some concerns if you just send individuals into those um, without being able to monitor, you know, activity within them. Um, and then somebody brought up dogs, which I love dogs. Um, in the, if we were doing the warehouse, would we be able to cordon off some areas? Would that be an option? Uh, I'm, I'm sure it could be a possibility. I think it would also depend upon the, the size of the warehouse that we would have in order to accommodate that. But um, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to look at something like that, uh, depending upon the size of the warehouse. Okay, thank you. Mayor, Mayor Kaufman, this is Cindy Collett, Public Works Director. Cindy, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. So in the day resource center, I wanted to mention also that the occupancy may be limited because of some of the um, HVAC and fire suppression limits. So we're working with uh, Lana and Jessica to um, evaluate those systems now. I just wanted thank to you. mention that with all the discussions. So. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Further discussion. Mayor, Councilor uh, Lawson. Lawson. Hi, Lana. I just had a question. So with the abatements coming up, because, you know, in the next month or so, um, are we with what we have now, because I'm looking at right now what we need to accommodate. So the AR ADRC open 27 right now would be, I think, good that we actually get that going, because then I, we could at least accommodate, um, you know, the abatement process based on the camping ban. Based on that and what we have now, would we really be will we be able to accommodate most people in the city and offer them? I mean, just if we have those solutions, what we have currently now, and if we do the ARDC, and I know another option would be, and we have the vouchers as well, but just accommodating that right now to look at op sheltering options for our um, homeless population. Sure. So if we look at our <laughs> sheltered count, we had 594 people. And again, that's not that that was just sheltered. That was not unsheltered. Um, this year we had another count. Those those numbers are not out yet. MDHI still has those numbers. Um, and so what I was looking at it as is 594 on any given night our total bed capacity without cold weather so this is without the adrc at all is between 210 and 285 and if we have cold weather which adds that 75 into play we get to 285 or 300 285 to 360 again the variance comes from the um the pallet shelters and, and fishing tents being able to accommodate a couple versus a single and so um 
we get to uh, about half of the population of folks experiencing homelessness based on their 2021 sheltered count, which was 594. And so if we're looking at abating um, all of the encampments as it relates to unsheltered individuals experiencing homelessness in the city of Aurora, I don't think that gets us there. Okay. Um, my second question um, for the ARDC, ADRC. Um, so is the security piece, are that to how many people in security? Because I know it has a magnetometer when you go in, there's only one way in and one way out and you have to go through the magnetometer, which adds some security, but I know there, there's things that go on. Um, is that to cover outside security and inside security? And how many, how many security would, how much, how many security or people doing security would be needed? Do you have an approximate on that? Yeah, so it's for 16 hours per day. Um, and that's two security guards during that 16 hours per day. Um, and again, it would be the night hours. That would be the focus um, would be the overnight. And my understanding from the emergency shelter was they would have one person inside and then one person would go out and do rounds outside and vice versa and they'd swap off. And so that's my understanding of how it would work here as well. Okay, thank you, Lana. Mm -hmm. Discussion. Let me just uh, put a motion forward then or at least um, for consideration, and that is, uh, I think we should start with the ARDC as a 24-hour, uh, seven-day-a-week uh, shelter. Um, I think that it's at 75 now, but when uh, the COVID rules are relaxed, and I think they soon will be, uh, that number could go as high as 150. Um, but there, there are already staff there that you're not duplicating in another location. Uh, by keeping two open, and then uh, if uh, that fills up, then we'll we'll be discussing a, a supplemental uh, location. Further discussion uh, on Mayor. that? Uh, yes, uh, Councilmember McConnell. Thank you, sir. Uh, I was going to suggest the pallet shelters. Uh, my concern with congregate shelters is that's going to be a lot less attractive to a lot of folks. Uh, we've already heard mention of people with pets. Uh, who refuse service at congregate shelters uh, because of that reason. And I'm also concerned about putting, you know, large portions of our unhoused community in the same spot. Just like anyone else, there are folks who people have issues with. And um, I think that we've seen, we saw some of that at the uh, hotel that we leased out during early COVID. Um, so I just, I don't think that that's going to necessarily be a recipe for success. I'd like us to uh, invest in something that, you know, while it might have a higher sticker price up front, uh, is at least more effective at transitioning people out of homelessness. So that's why I'd support the pallet shelters instead. Further discussion. Uh, I'm seeing no uh, further discussion then. Uh, is there objection to uh, starting with the um, and we can certainly go as a secondary to other things like pallet shelters, but we start out with the uh, a ADRC uh, with its capacity right now at 75 that will be able to go up once COVID uh, restrictions are, are, are relaxed and we could go potentially to uh, 150. And uh, is there opposition to that? Marcano. Council Marcano. Real. Coombs. Coombs. Medina. Medina. Further opposition? Uh, seeing uh, no further opposition, then that's the direction. Thank Mayor. you, Stan. I'm sorry. Mayor, may I add one additional thing? Um, um, yeah, Lana, go ahead. Oh, and we, um, in two weeks, I think if I understand it right, in two weeks, then we'll be discussing uh, permanent options. Uh, am I correct in that? Okay. Yeah, that, that's 100% correct. So we'll be looking at permanent options. Also, um, again, I just want to reiterate, we have to pass this through our service providers in order to, you know, understand their staffing capacity. And then third of that, uh, looking at funding options for these as well. So I just want to put all of those components out there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item number three F statewide collective bargaining position letter. Uh, Council Member Zvonik. Yep. Thanks, Mayor. Um, so this is a, a topic that we discussed um, maybe a couple weeks ago. It is um, in regard to a let or a um, legislation that has been 
in um, drafting state since the before session started and, and hopefully it remains that way and never sees the light of day. But um, this letter um, takes a position from the city to oppose the efforts to mandate um, collective bargaining on local governments and understanding that we are all going to have different um, points of view on, on public sector collective bargaining. I tried uh, in the, the drafting of the letter um, was done in such a way that we're not taking a position on public sector collective bargaining, but instead we're taking a position on the legislation that would mandate collective bargaining on local governments. Currently, um, state law allows for collective bargaining at the local level, but it requires a vote of the people. Um, and so we've seen when the, the law was passed, I want to say 2013, Governor Hickenlooper signed it into law. It would allow for local governments to go to voters and and um, expand collective bargaining beyond um, fire and um, police. But this bill, of course, would mandate it. It would add 250,000 local government employees and would be a huge unfunded mandate to local governments, including the city of Aurora, and, and likely a violation of home rule. So again, the letter is focused solely on the opposition to mandating it from the state level. Um, the, I we, it, this is I think Pfizer committee and, and uh, Councilmember Lawson, correct me if I'm wrong, has taken a position on this. If, if correct me again, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, in opposition to it. But this letter would say that we, as a council, hope that the legislature does not move forward with um, the mandate on local governments. Mayor, Discussion. Um, Mayor, uh, Mayor Lawson. I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, the um, the Pfizer committee did take opposition to this legislation and unanimously, and then we unanimously supported the letter as well. Very well. Okay. Uh, further discussion? Mayor. Uh, uh, seeing none, is there any opposition? Uh, um, uh, Councilmember Coons. Thank you. So I think, again, what we're looking at in terms of the letter and the approach that's being taken is a very partisan and political position. Um, and it's one that I think puts all of our city or all of our employees that are not members of police and fire in a worse off position. And we've seen them be in a worse off position. They didn't get bonuses um, while everybody else got bonuses for working through the pandemic, even though some of them were in much worse and much more exposed situations. Um, and they consistently don't have the same power and the same weight that they get to bring to the table. So it's really disappointing to me that we consistently undervalue our non-public safety employees. And this represents another example of that. So I will um, not be supporting this. And should this legislation come forward, um, unless there's something really egregious in it, I will be going to support that um, in my capacity as an individual. No further discussion. Mayor, just quickly, if I could. Uh, Council Member Zawanek. Yeah, um, so there, there's really nothing partisan about this, uh, Council Member Coombs. This is actually opposed by CML um, rural school districts. It's, it's really a function of local governments saying to the state, we don't need you to mandate collective bargaining. If our, if our community believes that that's the, the right approach, um, we can take it to the voters and they could pass it. And the letter as written just says that we don't want the mandate. It doesn't take a position on collective bargaining um, for and against. Um, it just says that the state shouldn't be violating home rule and mandating on us. Further discussion? But seeing none, is there opposition uh, to uh, moving um, Council Member Zelanik's letter forward? Uh, Coombs. Uh, Coombs. Council Member Coombs, Council Member O'Connell. Uh, uh, Council Member Morial. Further opposition? Medina. Uh, Council Member Medina, further opposition? I see no further opposition, then the, um, um, the letter will move forward. Um, uh, the time is now um, 8.24. Uh, council will stand at recess until 8.30.
Oh, council is now back in session. Uh, Arpa Community Grant Programs. Good evening, Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. My name is Christina McClelland and I'm the Grant Development Manager for the city. Um, and I'm here to present a proposed approach to ARPA community grant making um, for your review and direction. So as you'll, you'll recall at the winter workshop, um, several grant categories were allocated as part of the ARPA allocation process um, with the direction that staff should return with a proposed approach for review and direction. Um, so I'll provide this now. I'll go through each of these categories, also provide some information related to proposed administrative support, our communications plan, and um, then have time for your questions and feedback. So the first category is a nonprofit grant program of two and a half million. This program would provide funding to support nonprofits based in Aurora for COVID recovery efforts. Eligible activities would include one-time capital and programmatic expenses for. Oh, we lost it. Can you turn off? Oh, well, there we go. We're still not hearing you. I think she's fully disconnected, Mayor. Yeah, she disconnected. Well. Wow. Um, I tell you what, um, can we move on and then come back to that? Um, can we go to our planning and zoning commission vacancy, uh, Katie? Uh, yes, mayor and council members. This is just an update to let you guys know there's still one vacancy on the planning and zoning commission that needs to be filled in your backup. I provided um, a proposed schedule for um, the deadline to submit applications, which would be March 28th. Um, communications has advertised this vacancy recently, and I've been in contact with candidates that were previously interviewed to see if they would like to keep their application on file. April 4th would be the deadline for council members to submit their rankings, which would be reviewed at the April 11th council meeting. Uh, and then council would determine which candidates they would like to interview. Staff would conduct background checks on those candidates. And then the interviews would be conducted at the April 18th study session and the appointment of a commissioner would happen at the April 25th council meeting. So I just here to get direction from council to see if this is the schedule they would like to go by. Uh, discussion on the schedule timeline. Is there opposition uh, to the timeline? Uh, uh, what was the date, Mayor? I'm looking at my backup. Oh, I just found it. Is there opposition or, or questions of Katie? Uh, seeing none, then that's the direction um, we'll go. Uh, we back up at all on item number 4A. If not, um, oh, sorry. Mayor, sorry, this yeah. is Nancy Wishmeyer, and I can take over. Um, okay. Can Thanks I? And Lan or um, Katie, I'm sorry. Can you let me take control of the screen? Yes, we are passing it over to you right now. Are you seeing my screen? No, Nancy, we do not. Okay. 
And I was wondering, Katie, can you share the screen? Can you share the PowerPoint? Uh, yes, let me just pull it up really fast and I can share it for you. Thanks, sorry about that. That's okay. Well, as Katie gets that um, to come up on the screen, I'll just I'll talk a little bit about that nonprofit program. So this is the two and a half million dollars that was approved back in January at the winter, winter workshop. And so, yeah, if you just go to the next screen. Um, so basically, these are the eligible activities. Um, this would be for one time capital and programmatic expenses. And there is no max award. So we would be trying to fund multiple organizations with this two and a half million dollars. One application per organization. And some of the review criteria, first of all, community need benefits equity. We'd wanna see financial feasibility and capacity, the organizational capacity, and also the ability to leverage funds from various sources would be important. Previous performance, and also their project readiness. And the desired impact would be the increased capacity to meet community needs in Aurora. And the timeline we're looking to launch in this next quarter, 2022, um, with the application deadline, funding would not be on a rolling basis, and then funding would be spent by 2024. And then on the next slide, the behavioral health, this was for $3 million. And again, funding to support nonprofits based um, in Aurora, and this would be more behavioral health and mental health focused. The eligible activities would be, again, one-time funding. There would be no max award, but looking to uh, fund multiple organizations. The categories would align with the state behavioral health um, transformational task force. And we'd also want to be able to promote leveraging with that task force. So some of the eligible activities, integrated and coordinated care, um, be looking at gaps in the care across the continuum and trying to fill those gaps, um, community justice reform and care, also youth and children, and then workforce. Um, some of the, the review criteria would be, we'd be looking at program and project design, the um, entity's experience and qualifications, their fiscal capacity and their ability to leverage, and also their history of service in Aurora. And again, desired impacts, increased capacity and accessibility for behavioral health in Aurora. And also the timeline would be similar to the last one. We'd wanna be launching this in um, the second quarter of 2022. And then funding again would not be on a rolling basis and looking to spend the funds by 2024. Mayor, can I have a question? I'm sorry, uh, Mayor for Jim. Um, would would um, detox facilities be eligible for this um, behavioral health if they're helping with drug addiction, substance abuse? And we have a few others on the call that can answer some of the specific questions. I don't know, Jessica, are you still on? Nancy, this is Lana. Yes, detox would qualify. Any substance misuse disorder service provider would qualify. Okay, I think that's really important, especially when we're talking about trying to help our homeless population. Thank you. And then the next slide, we've got the small business grant program for two and a half million. And here we'd be looking at recovery grants of $5,000 for businesses that were created during the pandemic, and then $10,000 um, grants per business for existing businesses. 
And we'd be looking at some of the eligible activities would be startup capital, um, operations, personnel, um, tenant finish, inventory, working capital, um, reestablishment um, costs. And we would be looking at home-based businesses could be considered, no sole proprietors, and new businesses that were started in 2022 would not be considered. So okay. it's startup. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, startup businesses, minimum of six months in operation. Um, they need to demonstrate economic and business activity, um, created a product or service that responds to the um, pandemic. A minimum of one employee, including the owner, and um, being in compliance with state and uh, city licenses, permits, taxes. And we'd have approximately 50 grants in this area. And then for existing businesses, we'd want to see that they had started um, prior to um, January of 2019 and net revenues of $250,000 or less gross up to 5 million um, employees from one to 25 and also in compliance with city and state licenses, permits, and taxes. And we'd be looking at approximately 200 grants in this area. Mayor, can I ask a question here? Oh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Council Member Jaworski. So you have no sole proprietors? Uh, yeah, I just don't understand that. Does that also eliminate single member LLCs? I, I'm not, I, I'm really concerned um, I mean, I'm a single member, small business owner, and I know several that are. Um, I I would venture to guess most of the businesses in the city, um, the small business community, which this is called small business. So we're not talking big business here. We're talking small business. Um, I, I don't understand the no sole proprietors part, um, and, and I don't I don't think that that should uh, be included. Okay, and we do have um, someone from um, planning, I believe, on the phone call to tonight that can speak to that. And if Is not, there... we we can certainly take a look at that. So we'll, yeah. we'll flag that item. I, yeah, I, th there must be more to that because I mean, are you are you saying just because it's it, it may be an entity that's not incorporated or, or that this doesn't make any sense to me? Mayor, this is this is Roberto. Uh, yeah. I think our experience in CARES, what we're trying to it, sole proprietor is misleading. I think we're just like single employee uh, businesses. So if it's like a consultant, uh, it, this is I think it's being mixed. It's not a proprietor in terms of it would be just one employee, no other employees in the business. It would just be a one employee shop, essentially, is what we were uh, putting in. We could certainly change that and have a consideration for sole employee, one employee, but I think we're getting a, I think we're confused a little bit with proprietor. What we meant is uh, a, a single person who simply was maybe a consultant or was working yeah. for themselves, but not an actual business that had employees, multiple, more than one employee. Correct. This is a legal. This is Andrea Amanek from Planning and Development Services. The sole proprietor here is a legal designation of the business and refers to as, as Roberto said, is really just a business that's one person for the entirety of the business, not someone who owns it solely. It you know other businesses, LLCs, and so forth that have multiple employees are to be considered. I think that there, there's the legal definition and there's the general understanding of the term. And I, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I'll, I'll side with you on the legal definition. But uh, as a former small business owner, I, if you said sole proprietor, that uh, does uh, that's not necessarily just an, a single individual who's an independent contractor. I we, also agree. We'll clarify that then for you. Okay. Further discussion. I, Mayor Jurinsky. I guess Mayor Jurinsky. Um, so I, I guess I also still have a problem um, with the eligible activities um, as far as tenant finish. Is this the one that I was told? Uh, is this the program I was told that we are going to be building out kitchens? And if we cannot, that's a different one. 
that is the next program that we'll be discussing this evening. This is the program that gives uh, capital uh, that gives uh, grants to businesses to assist them with the issues and the reestablishment that you were very concerned about, Councilmember Jurinsky. Yeah. Um, and it's it, instead of being programmed, this is for businesses across the spectrum to help them recover from the pandemic and some of yeah. the expenses that they've had, operating expenses or any of the other types of capital expenses that they might need. It's very wide open for what sure. they need. I would just like to add, sorry, Mayor, can I? Oh, please proceed. Um, one thing I would like to really uh, send a message to city staff, um, is that you have here um, in compliance with city and state licenses, permits, and taxes. Some of us business owners in the city were faced with a really difficult decision uh, when our businesses were shut down two years ago. Um, and I would like to let city staff know, uh, you personally denied me for a grant. That's fine, right? Uh, I mean, that happens. Uh, no favoritism, no, right? I got denied for a grant because I made a decision as a small business owner. Some small business owners held on to their rent money. Some small business owners held on to their taxes, uh, you know, their tax money. Obviously, that would have been due by the 20th of the month. We were shut down March 17th. Um, I would like to caution city staff at just uh, denying applications if if someone isn't uh, you know, it's just behind a month or something on taxes. Obviously, this grant program is is a recovery program. Um, so some of these businesses probably need help. Um, and I would just like to add this note of caution to city staff before so blanketly denying an application. These people are, are applying for help for a reason. And I would just hope that city staff would, uh, you know, maybe talk to these people. Um, I was never asked, I was never, you know, hey, why haven't you paid your taxes yet? Or why haven't you, well, hello, uh, we were just shut down. And, and we're all, like I said, each business owner had to make a decision. Some held onto their rent money, some held onto their tax money. I would just really, really like to caution city staff to not make this a jungle gym process. And these people, these businesses are asking for help, help them. Further discussion? Okay, please proceed with the presentation. Katie, you can go to the next slide, please. So just some of the um, criteria for startups needing to be functioning as a legitimate business for the last six months, um, existing businesses, um, demonstrating issues with hiring, retaining staff, supply chain, um, shifting the business model due to the pandemic, increased costs due to the pandemic, those sorts of things. And then the desired impact would be to increase the financial capacity for startups so that they have a chance to survive, um, gap funding for existing businesses to increase their operational capacity um, so that they can get to pre-pandemic levels of sales, number of customers, operations, those sorts of things. And the timeline here is to launch this opportunity uh, for existing businesses in the second quarter of 2022, for the startups in the um, third quarter of 2022, funding would be rolling and we'd be obligating the funds by um, 2024. And the next slide, please. So on the restaurant renewal, this is $2 million of grant funding. Here, we would like to assist small food and beverage establishments um, in moving to more permanent locations and growing their businesses within Aurora. Some of the eligible activities would be to assist with infrastructure, um, vacant underutilized spaces to create spaces for smaller food and beverage operations. And the review criteria that we'd be using would be property owners agree to lease to non-credit tenants and um, participate in capital improvements. Tenants must have business financials and experience, um, capital investment and operating capital. And the desired impact is to increase the sales tax revenue at selected locations and growth in business revenue year over year. 
And the timeline for this program would be, we'd have three projects per year for three years. Um, each project would be approximately 18 months for implementation and funds would be obligated by 2024. So basically three tranches. I have a question on this one. Yep. Um, every time, sure. um, are the three projects per year, are those spread out um, with the different wards or are they all gonna be in one ward? Um, they will be individually approved and the, the hope is to spread them out across all of the wards. So this is intended to be a citywide program. And so we are looking for opportunities in each and every ward. Okay, so how will this be advertised? Because it just seems like sometimes people don't know about it. So one, one of the things that we're doing is looking um, and, and obviously talking to the individual council members to make sure that, you know, if there are vacant and underutilized spaces in shopping centers or, um, you know, locations within your ward that could really use some extra love because this is a partner, like a P3 partnership where we're working with the, the city is investing, the property owner needs to invest because it's their property and there will be restrictions on what they can do. And then we will also want the tenant to be, to have capital in the project and everything. It has to be more of a negotiated project rather than an application. So for example, um, we've already been referred by council member Jarinski and Sundberg, I think, uh, a business, and I, I don't know if the business has uh, was initiated in Ward 2, but they're interested in a location within Fitzsimmons. I've already spoken with the property owner. I need to speak with the t proposed tenant further to determine if this is a fit. And that's why it'll take a while to implement it over the year, be over the three-year period, because um, these are... Um, substantial projects that are everybody's investing in. So, but yeah, the- I, Sorry, I just, I, I feel like this particular program never gets um, really, um, that, that other parts of the city really don't ever get to take advantage of it. Uh, absolutely understood. And we're looking forward to working with you to make sure that locations in wards outside, we have a lot of vacant underutilized buildings in certain wards. And so that's probably why. And, and the first program that we did in this area was a pilot council member. So it, we believe it was successful. And so we do want to expand that. And you and I have talked about um, ideas for potential of expanding it to to individual wards. I can see vacant underutilized property in shopping centers all over the city being a great place to get this started in different places. Okay, thank you. Mayor Jurinski. Uh, Councilmember Jurinski. Um, just real quick, I tried to chime in before you got off the last screen. Did I hear that the small business grants will roll out Quarter two, wait, launch funding. For existing businesses. So March 31st is the end of the first quarter. So we're talking a couple of weeks. Um, we are in the process of developing that application and that's gonna be available in the second quarter to apply for that. And it's a rolling admissions as people apply for that. And we're gonna start council member with the existing businesses that so desperately need the help. And, and we think that it'll be more difficult to get the participants that are newer businesses because they don't have all the business financials and the information that are required to make sure that the um, grant complies for a newer business with the, um, with the ARPA funding requirements. Sure. Okay, and then on this next slide, uh, I, I just would like to, I, I will always, uh, I was against this in the budget workshop. Uh, I am not, absolutely not for uh, the city 
building a whole bunch of, of kitchens, putting in grease traps. I mean, when you talk retail space, you know, you can turn a retail space from like a video game store to a clothing store, you know, things along those lines pretty quickly. When you start going through and putting in grease traps and putting in hoods and putting in significant infrastructure like that in retail spaces, um, it's really hard uh, to really make it anything else. I will always, always, be against this, uh, the way that it is written. There are plenty of struggling, you know, uh, restaurants, bars in the city, um, and, and I'm against this. You mentioned that we referred somebody to you. You're right, we did refer to somebody to you, and, and the person that we referred to you is a military uh, veteran who is running a culinary program um, to, uh, to connect with veterans getting right out of the military um, and, and have a training kitchen. Um, he had a food truck for a little while. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of the name of it. Um, but but this is a this is a school program. This isn't, you know, for a uh, to start up, you know, a bar or restaurant in, in, in the city of Aurora. This is a military training program to help veterans get out, uh, you know, transitioning out of the military. I hope that he is able to uh, benefit from this program. But uh, so something like that, certainly I would, uh, I would refer to you as Council Member Sundberg and I both kind of teamed up on that. But the way this reads and and what this could do, you know, to our city and a whole bunch of vacancies. And then I remember I was told that any of these spaces that we build out, if the business goes under or something like that, then we become landlords trying to rent rent out uh, vacant kitchens. And well, that's what I was told, Andrea. That's what we were told in the budget workshop. So the property is usually the property is privately held and we partner with that property owner to release the space to other to other small businesses who are trying to be established. So we get involved in the in the in the releasing process. So the money that we invested in these so 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 then we lease the space to someone else and and our money just it sits in a grease trap, sits in the bottom of a grease trap. So we're investing in the, in the property owners because the property owners always own the space. And what it does is it provides an opportunity for instead of taking a city investment in a property and allowing it to, you know, to turn over and let the owner just lease it to whomever. We try to encourage and work with the owner to find smaller businesses that might not otherwise have an opportunity to rent um, space like this and who are, you know, um, small business owners who just need a chance to get started. So, um, cause we're so investing in private property. So I understand that, but in lease negotiations, in tenant lease negotiations, um, this is this would fall under TNI tenant improvements. So anybody who wants to open a bar, anybody who wants to open a restaurant, uh, or any type of business for that matter, a beauty salon that needs like a build out with with sinks, that any type of build out, that would fall under that. And the developer, the landlord, would help cover these costs to put in a if I come forward with a business plan or I, I come forward and and I say I want to open a restaurant but you know it's a vacant space and there hasn't been a kitchen there before. Um, so essentially what we're doing is is taking this cost off of the developer, off of the landlord, and we're saying that the city is going to put in grease traps and hoods and kitchens. I, I have a I have a very large problem with this. I always will I hope at some point my my colleagues see the same issues that I have with this. But okay, you know. well, I will um, we'll we'll provide direction uh, uh, on these items uh, to move forward or not uh, at the end. Uh, could you move to the next one? The next program is a safety and security grants. We've got $3 million allocated to this grant. And here, businesses, nonprofits, um, community groups, they would be reimbursed uh, for up to, that's $10,000. 
And this would be um, $10,000 worth of safety and security upgrades that had been um, identified and reviewed through this environmental design review that Aurora Police Department would do. So again, those approved updates or upgrades, improvements through that um, EDR, those would be eligible for reimbursement. And some of the eligible activities would be things like physical changes to enable social distancing, enhancing cleaning efforts, adopting safer um, operating procedures, and investing in technology and equipment to allow law enforcement to more efficiently and effectively respond to the rise in gun violence that was um, a result of the pandemic. And on the next slide. Oh, I, I'm sorry, are there any questions on this? Sure. And discussion. Uh, seeing none, then proceed to the next one, please. Sure. And, and this is just a um, page two, basically, of the safety and security. So some of the, the review criteria, this would be first come, first serve. And we would have um, $500,000 would be dedicated to the Cold Pass Corridor. So this would basically be between Yosemite and Peoria, and then also 14th and 16th Avenues. Um, businesses may have no more than 500 employees or be a small business concern as defined in the Small Business Act. And the desired impact would be to increase safety and security for Aurora businesses, nonprofits, and community groups. Okay. Um, the quick question on this. You have their example of Colfax in Havana. You've got Walgreens on the north side, and you've got, uh, a, well, franchise owned 7 Eleven, I think. I don't think it's corporate on the south side, but then you got a Walmart grocery store on the south side. How do you count those in terms of eligibility? Mayor, you're asking if they would all be. Part of the um, yeah, you say five hundred employees. Is that five hundred employees to the corporation, or is that five hundred employees to the site business site? Um, Andrea, how how did we handle that in in, in the last year when we were doing the cares? How did you guys handle the employee piece of that on a sort of corporate versus a franchisee? Well, let me and let me just say I'm fine for franchise franchisees. I'm fine for that. I, but I think that if you, you know Walmart is not a franchise, uh, and and Walgreens is not a franchise. Mayor, I thought we excluded all those big companies. I, I just want to make sure confirm that we have. Yeah. Okay, we'll take that as guidance, Mayor. That you're that we're okay with obviously um, sort of um, franchisees who who own right. larger and that sort of but but corporate owned stores are are it is your intention to not include those and so we'll take that as guidance. So I think that was Mayor. actually decided in in the workshop. I, I think it was, and this, this is just good clarification. So I think we'll 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 make sure we if we have any questions we'll return to council. But I think this is just good clarification for tonight. So thank you all. Further discussion. Seeing none, go to the next, please. All right. Um, so, like Christina had mentioned when she started um, the presentation, we are going to contract with Clifton Larson Allen, just like we did with the CARES money. Um, CLA will be helping us with uh, reviewing applications, um, designing the program. They have a portal that they use to. Um, kind of funnel through the applications. They'll be doing some monitoring for us and risk assessment. And what we're planning on doing is there is going to be um, a fee, and you can see there that they've got the fee for their proposal. It is a not to exceed of the 372,000. Um, that's just a little bit under three and a half percent of the total grant program, um, that fee would then be distributed among the programs that we just discussed. Um, but I understand they are not going to be doing a review of the restaurant program. So it'll just be the nonprofit, the behavioral health, the small business grant, and then the safety and security grants. Okay. Discussion? Mayor? Uh, Councilor Coates. 
Um, so on the behavioral health, I know that the original proposal was for $10 million, and now it's been dropped to $3 million. So the assistance that's going to be available to folks is going to be fairly limited. Someone couldn't do um, a decent infrastructure type project that would be a one-time cost. So I'm wondering if we can pull that one and come back with a discussion of what kinds of things we could potentially do with $3 million um, instead of the 10 million that was originally proposed. Uh, further discussion, uh, Council Member Coons, why don't we go through this and then uh, go ahead and, and, and then, you know, let, let, then we'll decide on your proposal. Sounds good. I thought we were coming to the end of the presentation. I think, is there any more slides? I'm sorry. Just one more, and this is um, the next slide talks about our communication plan, which was brought up already. Um, just the fact we want to get the, the word out. So we've got a number of methods that we will use, um, social media, um, city newsletters, the website, um, targeted emails to particular businesses, you know, organizations, neighborhood groups, et cetera media outreach um, and so and then we also have a couple of translated collateral materials based on the audience and then also targeted postcard mailings okay um uh, discussion mayor uh mayor Purdue. on the grant program um i mean i i think we need to be moving right away people were weren't they asking where the funds were so that they could go ahead and start applying for these for security. I mean, I think, you know, th they've had issues this past year with security and if we're gonna delay it even further, I, I, I think we, sh we need to get moving. Okay, is there a staff response? So on the security uh, programs in particular, Mayor, we know council is very interested in those. Uh, we have uh, been working with uh, the police department to begin, uh, or to prepare the uh, process uh, for inspecting these. Uh, so the resolution from council included that they would go through sort of a environmental design review process that would recommend um, uh, security enhancements that would be eligible for the grant. So they've done that. They've uh, gotten that down uh, to a, a, a manageable process. Uh, we are prepared uh, to begin uh, rolling out this security grant program uh, as soon as possible. We want to get guidance tonight. Um, we will be working to roll that out as soon as possible. PD is uh, prepared to begin doing those inspections uh, here uh, in the next week or two. Okay. Let me just say to the members, uh, what I'm looking for right now is any changes that you have that you that you that I can get a sense of the council on in terms of how to move forward with this uh, with the grant proposals. Mayor. Uh, Mayor Patam and then Council Member Coons. Um, so overall, I just wanna make sure that my earlier comment on detox services is definitely included in the behavioral health um, grants. Okay, uh, staff response, please. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, so that doesn't take any action. Okay, um, Council Member Coons. Mayor, so yeah, I'll just renew that proposal that we pull specifically the behavioral health to have some further conversations about ways to efficiently allocate that 3 million since it's so much less than what we were originally looking at. So just pull that one section, everything else I'm okay with moving forward. And then that okay. would come back, like work with staff and come back on that. Okay, um, so I'm gonna delay it some. So if I understand Council Member Coombs, uh, correctly what you would like to do uh when would you like to bring it back council member coons um i think that we could potentially have it back either at the next study session or the subsequent one um that would be a matter of what staff have time for in the intervening time um uh, staff response yes i believe we can do that in in, in that span of time yes okay very well okay so um the uh, council member Coombs uh, uh, would would like to um, uh, pull the uh, the mental health um, uh, compo uh, portion of the grants uh, and reschedule that for the next uh, study session. Is there any objection? 
Mayor? Can, um, can Mayor I get a, well, just clarification. Why are why are we doing that? Uh, Councilor Jones. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Bergen, because there are some folks that had wanted to look at projects when we were looking at the $10 million that now probably wouldn't be able to apply with the only 3 million that's there. Okay, so, but if they can't apply, they can't apply. I mean, don't we wanna get the 3 million out? That's what I'm not understanding, sorry. So just that their program projects might be a little bit larger. So it might be a little harder to get through a typical grant process because of how the proportion of the funding that it would now take up. Okay, all right. Um, further discussions? The same none is there objection to the Coombs proposal on the grants? Uh, Council Member Jorinsky. Uh, Mayor, I would also like to pull the well, I'm sorry, I've got a, I, I need to get a sense of the council first on this one. Is I'm sorry, is there objection to the Coombs proposal? Seeing none, then that's the direction for staff. Council Member Jorinsky. So I would also like to pull the restaurant grant program. Um, I think that in some ways it could be good, like the individual uh, that Council Member Sundberg and I referred to this program, but I think it needs a lot more uh, a lot more talking through. I would like to pull that program. Okay. Um, okay. So you can do two things. Well, number one, do you want to pull it completely, uh, or do you want to pull it to reconsider it two weeks from now uh, at the next study session? Yeah, well, I'm sorry. You can reallocate the money. So, you can reallocate the money somewhere else as well into another area. Um, that program is, is how, how, how much two and a half million? Uh, I believe so staff two and a half million. It's, it's 2 million for the two rest million, of the Okay. Um, can I talk to my colleagues, mayor? Can I? Oh, is there a discussion uh, on this? Uh, would anybody like to opine on this? Mayor, can I just ask council member Jorinsky, are you trying to just pull the restaurant renewal money or not the small business one, right? No. Yeah. No, no, not the not the small business. But the uh, restaurant. Which, yes. And restaurants can still apply for right. grants under the small business grant program as well. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I, I really have a hard time with these. Yeah. these so you're off. trying to sorry, so you're trying to take away the possible the kitchen well the applicable thing for the kitchen and try to see if we can discuss of how it should be reallocated. In yes. Overall. Yeah. So I, yeah. So I guess right now, Mayor, I would yeah, I would I would ask to pull that funding. Okay. So um and I would agree with Councilmember Jarinsky because I, you know, in my days in business it was always the the landlord's responsibility uh to to do um tenant finish. And, you know, and they have to, you know, they ought to be at risk in terms of really, under, you know, really studying the market to make sure that, that you know, that's an effective use of that space. And so um, I would agree with that, that that's, that's just, that's not putting, in my view, that's not putting money in the pocket of a small business entrepreneur, it's putting the money, uh, putting uh, money in the pocket of the landlord. Um, yes. Okay, so further discussion on the Jarinsky motion to pull, um, uh, I, I don't know, what the, the restaurant, it's not the, there's two restaurant proposals. The, um, what is it, how do you want to worry about, what is the name of the proposal? Restaurant renewal. Restaurant renewal uh, proposal uh, for two weeks uh, to the next study, study session. Mayor. Uh, Councilor McConnell. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm in opposition to this. I think we discussed this pretty uh, at length uh, during the workshop. Um, what, what this is basically acting like is a gap financing mechanism for entrepreneurs who want to start a restaurant. Um, as you all know, especially the tavern owners on the call, uh, is that capital construction uh, for that kind of, uh, or the cost rather of that kind of tenant improvement is much higher than some of the other uh, uses that we've discussed. I think uh, one of the examples was turning a video game store into a clothing store. That's true, the tenant improvement costs for that are much lower. Um, but we do have a large, uh, I shouldn't say large, but a lot of folks in our city 
uh, especially folks who are immigrants and refugees who want to open restaurants, but the initial cost of that kind of improvement is a huge barrier to them getting uh, started. And that's what this program, uh, to my mind, is trying to um, basically help with. Uh, we have done a lot of other things as a city over the years, long before any of us were on council, to help small businesses. We have interfered in the market one way or another. Um, I don't see why we would start drawing the line now. Um, and I can't help but note just a little bit of a conflict of interest in the opposition. I, I just, it's really not sitting well with me. Um, so I would, uh, again, just strongly support this program moving forward. Um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a great um, idea and I think it'll uh, reap some fruits for our community. Mayor Jurinsky. Mayor. Uh, Councilmember Member Jurinsky. I would just like to point out to Council Member Marcano, who lives in the area of where uh, Council Member Sunberg and I own bars and restaurants. Council Member Sunberg is located directly across the street from a very large uh, bar and restaurant. My one of my locations sits in the same shopping center with another bar and my other location in Aurora sits in the shopping center with two other uh, bars and restaurants. So I would just like to point that out that what what thrives what what thrives the service industry is absolutely competition and we position ourselves to be near each other. With that being said, my point is the landlords, the developers, they take care of a lot of these costs in, in tenant improvement and tenant finishes. And when I when I referred to a game store and a clothing store, I'm saying, you know, you it's very easy to, you know, if, if it's that type of business, if it's a vape shop, if whatever business, to turn it into a clothing store, turn it into another kind. Once you put this infrastructure in, once you put these grease traps in, these hoods in, that doesn't just, you know, if, if that business doesn't make it. That doesn't just become a clothing store the next week. That's my point. Okay, uh, further discussion on the uh, Jurinsky uh, proposal to Mayor. pull uh, the restaurant renewal grant. Mayor. All right. Um, is it Mayor Pertim? Uh No, Murillo. Oh, uh, Councilor Murillo. Yeah, I mean, we, we already had this conversation at the winter workshop, so I guess we're just going to ignore past those past conversations and decisions. I, I don't support this. I think... Um, you know, we, this isn't something that we're just developing now. It's a pilot that we have tested, um, to see if it can support our redevelopment efforts. Um, and I think if, if our staff is saying that it was successful in supporting a more functional use for a space, I think that is something that we should really capitalize on and look for other areas of the city that might benefit from this type of use. It is extremely cost um burdensome to uh, include a commercial kitchen um for like an individual you know business but what i like about um the city working with the landlord is that it's not just the city that's putting up money the landlord is also going to contribute to the costs as well so it is kind of that shared investment and i think they even asked the actual business owner uh, as well not the the landlord but they asked the the city to participate the landlord and the business owner to um contribute in um in contributing to the cost so it's not necessarily enriching one party or the other i i think it's making it more accessible i have a lot of businesses that are home-based businesses in in the district and i mean i would assume across the city that are looking for a way to scale up and when you think about how expensive it is to do that, it's just incredibly cost prohibitive um, in that way. And we've seen, um, especially in Ward 1, but likely there are other areas as well, that there is a lack of commercial kitchen space in the area, right? So this is filling a, a market gap that we are seeing. There are lots more businesses that are, you know, this obviously is right pre-COVID and, you know, I this is the, the, the point is to help get us back there. but. We had a problem where we had too many businesses that um, had to that were home based that didn't have a viable option to be able to scale up um, because we just the the area didn't have enough infrastructure like a commercial kitchen to be able to do so. So I disagree. I think that um, I think that this is making it more cost effective for those types of businesses to be able to 
enter more brick and mortar stores, right? Where we're seeing businesses close their storefronts because of what happened during the pandemic. I think we should be supporting efforts to revitalize those areas and make sure that they're not just held vacant. Um, and I think there's lots of research that our staff does to target areas that, um, again, any business could go in a potential location, right? But locations that are viable, that have the commitment from the landlord, the business owner, and the city to cost share in that way, and that that restaurant use is, is an efficient and effective use um, of that location and that monies. So I, I disagree, um, and I won't be supporting this. Okay, let me get a sense of the uh, council. Uh, who is in opposition to the Jurinsky uh, proposal to uh, delay? I'm sorry. Council Member Medina? Yes, sir. Marcano? Council Member Marcano? Coombs, only because I think this could help us address blight. Council Member Coombs? Um, Murillo? Council Member Murillo, is there anyone else who is in opposition to the Jurinsky uh, proposal? Mayor, can I make a clarification? It's not just to postpone the conversation, it's to completely reallocate the money, correct? Oh, we don't know yet. I think um, what the only thing that's on the table right now is to delay the decision to the next um, uh, study session to give Council Member Jurinsky to take a look at it. Uh, obviously, she's opposed to the program, but she can, she can at that time could um, have a proposal before us to reallocate the monies. Am I correct in that, Council Member Jurinsky? Yeah, I mean, if there's not gonna be anything changed to this program, I my proposal right now can be to reallocate this money or to put it back in our- Well, I, I tell you what, why don't you take the two weeks, uh, just a suggestion, take the two weeks to look at it. To, so you can come up with, you, you may come up with a proposal to make it work to, in terms of how you, Think of my work, or that you you may come up with a proposal to reallocate it. What you what I understand the Jurinsky proposal to be is to simply delay the decision on this particular um, uh, grant proposal uh, for for until the next regular study session. Am I correct in that? Yes. Okay. So, um, Mayor. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mayor Patim. Okay, so we are we are delaying it, correct? Uh, if uh, if um, we only well, have right four. now, yes, I, it, it seems that um, um, there are um, four in opposition uh, to it moving forward. So I believe that a majority uh, are for it moving forward to where it will delay for two weeks. The majority yeah. are for delaying it. Um, that's my understanding. Is there anybody else in opposition? Okay, so there's four in opposition. Okay, um, then that's the direction to council. Um, are there any other um, changes uh, to the grant proposal? To any of the grant proposals? Uh, seeing no no further changes, then that's the direction to council, to staff. Uh, item number 7A, a discussion and consideration of changes to appendix G, paragraph J, uh, the city council rules relating to the censure process. And I believe after this, uh, city attorney uh, would like to discuss the censure, the existing censure issue. But let me just say, I, I, uh, you know, I, I regard Charlie Richardson as a friend, and um, uh, known him for a very long time. Disagree with him on this particular procedure that he put in place. So I've asked the city attorney's office to look at some options for us. Uh, I know in uh, the city of, uh, I mean, Commerce City is the last center that I know where, and, but I believe that that was just a, a, so a member introduced a resolution, a council member introduced a resolution and the majority voted for it. And uh, the censure was well publicized uh, against the mayor and, and the mayor's conduct. So um, with that, let me uh, defer to the, to the city attorney right now to go to discuss um, my request is to look at some other options. And Mr. Bedork, if you could kick us off. Certainly, thank you, um, Mayor and Council. Uh, uh, at the mayor's request, I, I, I did look at some options, uh, primarily trying to simplify the process. 
I think uh, the uh, current process, to say it politely, is is heavily driven by lawyers, and I I'm, I'm not sure that's the, the, what council would like to you know, for the process to look like in the future. So so as I, I looked at options, uh, I'll, I'll start with the. Uh, the uh, mayor's example with Commerce City, that's actually the most common process in uh, Colorado. Um, uh, looking at the various council rules, uh, most of the, the council rules do not address censure uh, specifically. Uh, that means that a censure process would follow the ordinary course of a, uh, a resolution. How that would apply in, in Aurora is any council member using their own prerogative under the rules of bringing an item before council could do so in the form of a resolution and ask the council to vote on that item. Um, that's that's the, the case with, again, a majority of the, 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 the cities in, in Colorado. The, uh, the next in terms of simplest would be in your backup, I included the Denver process and um, uh, that uh, that that tweaks that idea just a little bit in that it it requires a uh, a, a, a supermajority to uh, pass the, the the resolution, but it is still brought by a member. Um, it's drafted by the uh, the uh, the uh, council sec uh, the council secretary in consultation with the legal advisor for the council, uh, and then it's, it is presented to the council. The, the council is free to make uh, motions to amend or to approve or disapprove. And if you read through, it's a very short rule. It does set specific timelines in, 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 in the, it sets uh, limits on, uh, on the, uh, the, the, the time allowed to respond and the time allowed for the other council members to comment and, and, and talk about the item. Um, the, for the next three uh, examples I've pulled, all three are coincidentally from California. Um, uh, and if you if you look page wise, they don't necessarily look what you'd consider simple. Um, but I'll start with the Los Angeles one, and in that, yes, it has a fairly complicated council censure process, but it also includes a a process at the beginning for a, a motion of disapproval. And that motion of disapproval carries, it, it is not a censure, but it is a, a, a it is a process that's it's done similarly to any other resolution. And it's short of a censure. It's council saying that they disapprove of an activity or an action of a council member. If there is a, a, a desire to pursue the censure process, then all three of the count, all three of the, the, the California processes share a common uh, process, and that is it puts it with puts the authority to a uh, ad hoc committee of council to make one of three determinations. The first is that further investigation is warranted. And then that ad hoc committee completes that investigation and ultimately reports that to council. The second option is if further, if the ad hoc committee does not think of further investigation is needed, it can forward the, the motion for censure immediately to council without an investigation. And then the third option is that the ad hoc committee doesn't see merit. The ad hoc, ad hoc committee recommends to it makes a finding that that it doesn't see merit and it reports that to the to the full council and each one of those decisions then would be subject to the full council's approval or disapproval and and additional motions so that's common among all three of the california examples one call out exception it, it was with the um uh martica um uh city they have a similar to the Los Angeles model where they have the uh, the disapproval. The Martica model has a, a an admonition resolution process, and what's interesting about that admonition process is it's 
it's short of even a finding of impropriety. It's basically a warning that if you if if things are or if you were to be telling a council member if you were in fact doing this conduct, we f would find that that conduct is not acceptable. It's not a finding that the conduct even took place, and therefore it's there's no requirement of uh, of um, an additional investigation. So it's 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 kind of a hybrid between uh, a a. a, a uh, an or a uh, resolution of uh, at, or of uh, of disapproval or a, 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 a um, censure motion. So those are the examples I came up with. I don't know if um, council has some feel for the way they would like to go. I will emphasize these are your rules. This is how this process works is ultimately up to council to decide. Thank you. And this, this is for information only, um, but I um, would hope that um, council members take a look at some of these uh, options. Uh, and it, it, let me just add, Jack, let me ask you about the Denver option again, that that is um, pretty consistent with other cities in Colorado where it's just uh, a, a member makes a motion, um, you know, based on concerns or allegations of the of conduct of another member. And, and that, um, oh, obviously that, that legal helps uh, draft it, their, their respective, well, they have a separate, they have their own legal, I think, and uh, the city council uh, has its own legal. And so that, that there's assistance uh, by legal in drafting it, uh, but that is introduced by a member and then voted on it requires a two thirds vote, supermajority vote. Am I correct? Well, it, it requires actually in Denver, it, it requires a seventy five percent. Okay. In in, okay. in our in our charter, we recognize the two third exception, so that's probably where we'd land first. Two thirds. Okay. Okay. Um, any uh, any further discussion on uh, these Mayor, options, Member Tim? Um, this needs to go to the rules committee, and I thought I, I know you wanted for information um, at study session, but. Um, I think I had actually planned to bring it to rules just uh, because it is too complicated and and too too attorney heavy um, the way it's written currently. Absolutely. So further further discussion, Mayor, uh, Councilmember Rocano. Thank you, sir. Um, I agree that the current process is very convoluted and does not yield um, anything that is transparent or really worthy of public trust. Um, I'd also like to add that I think that once the motion is made, um, I don't think it's actually appropriate for council to even really be involved in that. Um, I'd like to actually see us removed from that process because I've seen firsthand how you can have uh, partisan corruption in this now. So I would very much prefer to remove uh, council from the equation to allow members to bring forward motions at their you know discretion. Uh, obviously, if someone is abusing it, that's gonna become very apparent very quickly. And that person should face consequences, I think from the electorate, not necessarily from their colleagues. Um, but I, I just don't think that the current process that we have is great. I don't like having uh, supermajority requirements because, uh, again, you can use gamesmanship and favoritism to protect bad actors from accountability. Um, so that's the direction I'd like to see us go. But I do agree that what we currently have uh, it could definitely use some improvement. Further discussion. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Um, uh, City Attorney, do we need uh, further discussion? Uh, yes, I'd like to give an update of the current censure that's going on. Very well. So at, at the last executive session, council gave direction that they did not vote. Council gave direction to the attorneys preparing and presenting the case. Those are the attorneys of the outside council, which is outside council is supposed to be, uh, again, a very a very heavy, heavily attorney weighted process that we have now. Outside counsel is retained. Uh, currently, it's the attorneys from Burns Vegan. Well, we're in the room. Uh, counsel gave direction to those attorneys to, uh, to try and stipulate with Council Member Jurinsky's attorneys, uh, Mr. Lane and Mr. Hari, uh, to come to a stipulation. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that hasn't been successful between uh, 
between those attorneys currently. There, there are three main topics that are still open. One is the scope of the investigation and, and a release that's being sought under the stipulation. Uh, and that really goes to um, what what is supposed to be looked at. Is it simply the statements that were made on the radio or does it go to, in the conversation on the radio, there were uh, was a conversation with the police chief mentioned and the city manager. So that is still being worked out on on what is the scope and then what is the release of any stipulation. Uh, in this matter, Mr. Lane didn't have time to interview the chief and or, or the city manager. Um, so the question is, if if everything's being wrapped up by the stipulation, should that interview, should those interviews still take place? Um, and the third issue is regarding attorney's fees. The council rule indicates that a council member who is the subject of a hearing shall be entitled to reimbursement from the city for all reasonable attorney's fees incurred in his or her defense if a violation has not been established by a two thirds vote of the entire council. Um, the question is, does, does the stipulation resolve this? Do, it, is council required to vote to uh, pay, to reimburse council member Jurinsky's attorneys? So again, council gave a direction to try and enter some stipulations that has not been achieved at the current time. The uh, attorneys for both sides are still trying to work this out and work through it, but but that's the current status of where we're at. Are there any decisions we need to make at this point in time? Not currently, because until until they until the attorneys meet and, and come forward with stipulations, no. Very well, can okay. I, can I ask a question? Uh, Mayor Pertem. So if the attorneys, are, are not able to come to a stipulation. So we're just, it's just racking up attorney fees as this goes on. And the, the answer is yes, because uh, again, I think that's what? weird because we gave direction to come to a stipulation. And, and, and I want to be careful because I'm not allowed to disclose anything okay. that, that was actually discussed in the executive session. Uh, again, oh, well, that was in the Sentinel paper, the whole thing. Yeah, I, I understand, but I'm, I'm still prohibited from having Correct. discussions of what happened in an executive session. Okay. But again, the cost, I, I understand the cost and, and thus the rule change is, and trying to get this resolved is, is one of the, you know that's imperative. That's that's the focus of every of both sides uh, of trying to get this resolved in a fair manner. Um, Dan, at what point can we give direction in terms of of paying uh, uh, Councilmember Jurinski's lawyer? And and the answer is, uh, while there is an argument between the two groups, the the simplest the simplest method is probably just to bring this back to, for council to approve the stipulation and to uh, to pay the fees. That, that's, that's the easiest, least expensive attorney-wise making them stop fighting amongst themselves to get this mm -hmm. raised. But that can be done during a um, study session, right? No, uh, the, the actual vote would take place at a council meeting. Okay. Well, any questions? This is for information only. Are there any questions? I'm seeing none, Dan, thank you very much. Do you have anything else, Dan? No, no, Mayor. Okay. Um, Mayor, uh, can I ask one question, Jurinsky? Uh, Council Member Jurinsky. Um, Attorney Brockman, I just have, so, so you said that you wouldn't be allowed to talk to the media, but we're telling you we've read all about this in the media. So are council members prohibited from discussing um, executive session happenings to the media? Yes, the, again, your council rules prohibit council members from disclosing uh, information from an, from an executive session to an outside party. That would that obviously covers the media. And, and if that happened, if that were to happen, um, which it did this past week, what 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 can we do to rectify that? What would that punishment be? 
And we're back to the council rules that we've been discussing tonight. So that would be a council rules violation subject to censure. Thank you so much. Uh, further, uh, any further discussion questions? Okay. Um, okay, uh, seeing no further um, uh, items before the, the council, uh, this study session is adjourned. Thank you, everybody.